<laughs> All right. <clears throat> I'd like to call to order the regular board meeting of District 219 at 6.30 p.m. Um, we have a roll call, please. Ah. Right. May I have a roll call, please? Member Abraham? Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Dr. Coe? Member Wood? Here. Member Stunnett? Here. Member Nowick? Here. Member Durr? Here. Please stand if you are willing and able to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Do I have a motion to go into closed session for the purpose of Section 2C1 with respect to the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees? performance of specific employees of the public body and with respect to the employment and compensation of specific individuals who serve as independent contractors of the public body and section 2C2, collective negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or their representatives or deliberations concerning salary schedules for one or more classes of employees. So moved. Second. All right. Roll call, please. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Abraham? Member Nowick? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Dr. Coe? Member Durr? Yes.
Good evening, everyone. Gang the gavel. Louder. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good evening, everyone. We are re-entering open session at 7.31 p.m. We have a roll call, please. Member Wood? Here. Member Dr. Coe? Member Nowick? Here. Member Abraham? Here. Member Stennett? Here. Member Jacobs? Here. Member Durr? Here. All right. I call to order the public hearing on December 5th, 2023 at 7.31 p.m. for the purpose of property tax levy. I'll give us brief introduction and then we can see if anybody wants to testify. Um, as we discussed back on November 14th at the last board meeting, um, the property tax extension for last year was $155,525,033. According to the property tax extension limitation law, the, the board can request up to a CPI with a cap of 5% plus a factor for new property. Uh, that's what we have in the plan and that's what was in the tentative levy. So uh, we'd be asking for a 7.4 increase in, the, in that amount that I just indicated, which winds up being 166932000 even. Um, again, we ask, for, we ask the county clerk for a little bit more than what we think we're going to get because if you don't ask for enough, we don't get what um, we may otherwise receive as for the district. Um, that's about it. Any questions? Number what? Uh, Tim, for the benefit of the public, could you review the current debt service? Oh, very good. So that what I just described has to do with the operating funds. There's also a separate levy that's for the, our debt service, and the debt service is what that is. It's basically, it's very similar to a person's mortgage payment. So. If the if the district had uh, bonds outstanding that it would have that it would, would issue for um, property improvements or new buildings that type of thing, the debt service is what our payments would be on that. As you all know, uh, uh, earlier this month the 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 uh, board paid off all of the district's remaining debt, so the debt service levy is zero because we have no debt to pay off. So it's a great thing. So thank you for that. Left off the best part. <laughs> <laughs> it's because Tim's so modest. All right. Any other questions? All right. Are there any public comments? No. Yes. As a board member, I value transparency to our Niles Township community, and I want to keep you, the taxpayers, informed about the financial challenges the school district levy may have on your taxes. The impact of inflation has been felt by all of us, and D219 is feeling its impact also. It is essential for us to improve the standard of education we currently offer. This proposed tax levy is necessary to support our schools, teachers, and programs that directly benefit our students. The funds generated from this levy will be invested directly into our schools, ensuring that our students have access to quality education, updated resources, and a supportive learning environment. I understand the financial burden this levy may pose to some members of the community. Rest assured that I am committed to using these funds responsibly and being fully accountable for every dollar spent. By investing in D219 education now, we are laying the groundwork for a brighter future for our community and our students. I am grateful for the ongoing support of our community. Your commitment to the education and well being of our students is what makes our district strong and I appreciate your commitment in paying your property taxes and shaping the future of our schools. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hearing no other public comments, um, I call the public hearing to a close at 7.35 p.m. Okay. Thank you. 
right. Are there any changes to the agenda? I do not believe so. Okay. We will now proceed with the normal public comments. We will hear in-person comments in the order that they were received. And each, each individual will have up to three minutes for their comment. Um, the board secretary, Member Jacobs, will let you know when your time has expired. Uh, public comments will proceed for one hour. And we're going to start with, uh, and apologies if I am mispronouncing anyone's name, we're going to start with Sadia. and purpose of education, the freedom to think and to express those thoughts in a respectful manner. I was present at this meeting last month when numerous parents stepped forward with a demand to punish certain students because they had the humanity, audacity, and moral courage to bring attention to a genocide that is being currently live streamed across the world in graphic detail. One of the poorest people on earth, the people under a severe blockade for nearly 20 years, a people that is bombarded repeatedly since its inception, a nation which is not have an army, navy, air force, or even an airport is being carpet bombed brutally by a technological and military giant, mercilessly in the name of self-defense. Even though there is no self-defense for an occupying power, and the occupied always has the right to resist according to Article 51 of the Geneva Conventions. Collective punishment is entirely against humanitarian law, but Gaza is undergoing a brutal collective punishment, the death toll of which is upwards of 20,000 people, mostly innocent women and children. Indeed, I am most certainly an anti-Zionist. I oppose this political ideology with the core of my being. It's a racist ideology that encourages an apartheid system. Criticism of a nation that is premised on Zionism, which is indiscriminately committing genocide against a defenseless population, is not anti-Semitism. Zionism is not anti-Semitism. I'm not saying this alone. British pro Jewish professor Avi Schleim has explained this difference as well. So have people like Norm Finkelstein. Political criticism of the policies and actions of a nation are not commensurate to hatred towards the religion of Judaism or its followers. When our students or our community expresses our horror and outrage at the actions of the state of Israel, we are not being anti-Semitic. We are expressing opposition to a brutal occupation. We have good company also in that Israel for its illegal actions and aggressions against the Palestinians has been sanctioned numerous times in the UN for human rights violations. However, due to the power of the American veto, it has never been held accountable, thus setting the stage for further and further aggressions, such as the current genocide which we are witnessing. One minute uh, left. I would just like to say that as a Muslim, I'm compelled to be on the side of truth. In the words of Dr. Norman Finkelstein, the child of Holocaust survivors and a man who has devoted his life to the study of the Israeli-Palestinian situation, I'm not pro-Palestinian, I'm not pro-Israeli, I'm pro the truth, and the truth is on the side of the Palestinians. My community and I do, do not have any conflict with the Jewish people or their faith, and neither did those students who were part of that protest. Despite the conflation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism by so many of the parents who spoke at the last meeting, it is quite obvious these are quite literally two different ideas with two radically different goals. The goal of those who oppose the state of Israel's occupation is merely a restoration of the rights of the Palestinian people, Time which they've been deprived of for the last 75 years. Thank you. I want to ask that everyone please refrain from clapping so that we can get to everyone that uh, is trying to speak on today. Um, next we have Shaheen. Hi, my name is Shaheen and I'm a parent of four Niles West graduates. I know the struggle my children went through as Muslims in Mark District High School and want to speak up for all our children are currently in our schools. Although the district is somewhat su supportive of our Muslims and Arab students, it needs to do a lot more. Our students regularly, regularly feel silenced and unsupported, especially those who are Palestinian. Often they are made to cover and hide 
their feelings in fear that if they speak their story and suffering will somehow be labeled as offensive. I request the district to make sure all our students feel safe physically, emotionally, and especially in expressing their identities. As our district is so diverse, I request the board to require all students training on all staff to uh, training on how to have unbiased dialogue in classes about conflicts. Staff who are not discussing conflicts in class should still be able to navigate discussion that one minute left may come up to ensure all students feel welcome and so that no staff imposes their own political views. I want to thank the board for their support so far for for the teachers who are were being smeared online and for the kids who did not, did the sit-in protest. I would like to clarify that we respect the Jewish community and I request the board to continue supporting our students' voice, opinion, freedom of speech and expressions like saying free Palestine and wearing pro-Palestinian clothing and the right to criticize government without being mislabeled anti-Semitic or for criticizing the Israeli government that you Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have um, Bill, I believe this is Patterson. Good evening. My name is William Patterson. My reason for speaking tonight is to ask the board to vote in favor of the motion that will be put before the board this evening to change the scope of the work of the Niles West pool renovation and cancel the contract with Stuckey Construction Company. It is understood that there is a cost in the neighborhood of $570,000 associated with doing this for the materials that have already been procured. These materials and the dollar, dollars spent I do not feel are lost since they can be used in whatever the final pool reconstruction, renovation, or addition turns out to be. Spending $570,000 to re-examine what is truly needed is a far more physically responsible than spending $7.3 million and ending up with nothing better than what we currently have. A stop in the process now would allow all stakeholders to have input into what the pool needs are now and in the future. This input was not asked One minute for left. or elicited previously and should have been. Again, I ask that you vote in favor of this motion Voting yes offers the ability to change the direction of this pool renovation to one that is be that better serves the current and future needs of our students, athletes, and district. Thank you. Next we have Melissa Ivsko. Good evening, my name is Melissa Ayusko and I am here today in regards to the Niles West Swimming Pool and because I urge you as a board to approve the motion to change the scope of the Niles West Swimming Pool renovation and cancel the contract with Stuckey Construction Company. As a taxpayer in this district, I do understand that there may be concerns about the monetary costs associated with such cancellation. However, the cost of not canceling this contract is so much greater than any monetary amount already invested when we look at serving the current and future students of District 219. Over the last few months, you have heard over and over again the current pool facility does not meet the current needs for the students and athletes at Niles West High School. If the current needs are not being addressed and met, we are guaranteed that the future needs continue to go unaddressed and unmet. This is the time to seize the opportunity to halt the current plan and reevaluate the pool project for the future. This is the time to gather input from the people who use the pool the most in regards to what they need. While you, as members of this current Board of Education, did not make the initial decision and approvals for the currently contracted renovation, One minute left. you are the current Board of Education that our concerns have been presented to. I truly believe that our concerns have been heard and that you recognize there is a need to make a change. You have this unique opportunity to make the necessary change. So please vote to approve the motion to change the scope of the Niles West Swimming Pool renovation and cancel the contract with Stuckey Construction Company. Thank you for your time. Again, we're going to ask that you please refrain from clapping so that we can get to everyone who's requested to speak on today. And next we have Abuk, Abubakar May. 
School institutions protests played a pivotal role in shaping the world that we live in today. The Civil Rights Act, which ended in racial segregation and discrimination in the United States, was a direct result of such protests. In Ireland, the demonstrations during the Troubles raised international awareness about the unjust occupation leading to eventual peace, talks, and rec reconciliation. Similarly, the global outcry against the apartheid in South Africa, uh, Africa, largely led by students and activists, brought about a eventual dismantling. The very same spirit and of protest and activism is alive within our own students who seek justice in the face of a long-standing conflict that has persisted for over 75 years. Today we are confronted with a stark reality that 15,500 people, a majority of them women and children, are being tragically killed by Benjamin Netanyahu and Genocide Joe. Yet where is the condemnation? It is imperative that we raise our voices against such injustices and our students are at the forefront of this movement. Many of the students protesting today are descendants of those who fought valiantly against the Axis forces during World War II. Let us not forget that One France during World War II had over 250,000 soldiers from Muslim Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and the largest British regiment came from the Indian subcontinent, which consisted of over a million Muslims. I'm deeply saddened by the comments of some parents who are trying to label these students as anti-Semitic purveyors of hate speech. It is a disservice to their legacy and a forefront of the principles of free, of, of free speech. I respectfully implore that this action cease immediately. And instead, let us encourage students to stand together against injustice, transcending boundaries, and indifferences. Let us remember Isaac Rabin in, in, his, in, in his song for peace. In conclusion, our students are not enemies. They are the future leaders who have profound understanding of the importance of justice and peace. Let us support them, nurture their desire for a better world, and stand united as a communication to condemn violence while upholding our cherished values of free speech and justice. Together we can bridge div div uh, div uh, divides to foster understanding among Palestinian Israelis, Muslim and Jews, and all of humanity. Thank you. Next we have Paul Torres. Hello, my name is Paul Torres. I'm a parent of a current Niles West student athlete and a soon to be freshman student athlete at the school. I've been a teacher coach of this district for over 20 years as well as an alumni of Niles West. However, my entire 20 years working here, I've only coached at Niles North as a swim coach. This is my first year coaching and teaching at Niles West and I thought it'd be a great part of, uh, to be part of my own children's journey through their high school years. The board has heard many arguments against the current renovation plan of the Niles West pool. You've heard from student athletes, parents, coaches, and even grandparents that the facility no longer fulfills the needs of the student body due to its lack of size and given the number of swimmers, divers, water polo players, and general student population that uses this pool. And I don't want to rehash all those arguments. However, I wanted to share my experience that just happened to me a week ago as I started my first week as a boys swim coach for 2023. We had 70 boys come out for the swimming and diving team, a number that could easily be accommodated a pool like Niles North with its 14 lanes and separate diving well, something I've been very accustomed to. A pool where every student can swim, dive, and play water pole One all left. at the same time during their respective sports season if they wanted to. However, the pool like Niles West with its antiquated six lane capacity, I was forced to make cuts for the first time in my career. It was an agonizing decision as I had to choose eight boys that could not be part of the team. All of them could swim with their face in the water, breathe to the side on their freestyle. Nevertheless, I had to tell each one of them they could not stay because there is no room for them. The ones that could stay still have to swim in the morning three days a week because there's no room in the afternoon. We have practice in about 10 hours from now. I ask you to think about what impact the coaches and teachers you employ here can have on our students if just given the opportunity. The sunken cost to cancel this pool plan is nothing when compared to the sunken cost of our children's well-being and overall belief in themselves in this school. These young adults that I can help, that others like me can help, the other coaches and teachers at these schools will help them, but let help us help them. Please approve the motion later today to change the scope of the Niles West Swimming Pool renovation and cancel the contract with Stuckey Construction Company so that future generations can benefit from the facilities and guidance that this school district has to offer. These kids deserve that. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we have Murat Sawala. <clears throat> Hi, um, my name is Murat Sawala. I'm a student at Niles West High School. 
I viewed last month's meeting where I heard many parents try and criticize students for doing a sit-in for a brutal genocide. I'd like to thank the school for allowing space for Palestinian students and others an opportunity to heal at the Mina field trip yesterday. But I'd also like to emphasize that Palestinian students and all students have a right to express themselves and that they shouldn't fear advocating for themselves and their families. The phrase, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, holds a profound per significance for many Palestinians, representing the desire for freedom, self-determination, and the right to live peacefully in their own land without the constant threat of displacement or violence. It's vital to emphasize that this sentiment is about advocating for a homeland and not about propagating hate. The administration's silence and lack of support amid the escalating death toll, reaching a staggering 20,000 lives lost, have left me feeling abandoned. Me personally, I am not someone who cries, but as I watch fathers look for their children under the rubble of bomb buildings, young kids bidding their last goodbye to their fathers and mothers, all while they are starving and dying of thirst, I cannot help but to cry for them. I and many others face and feel our family's hardship, yet it is rarely brought up. It's been disheartening to witness the school administration taking a clear stance on one side of the conflict by sending an email sympathizing with Israelis while seemingly ignoring the immense suffering experienced by Palestinians. Although they followed up the email, email saying they sympathize with both sides, I believe the initial lack of understanding of what they're emailing for, uh, emailing calls for better education of staff and students about the current conflict, as it has been going on for generations. I believe the school shouldn't take sides at so times like this, but creates the basis for students to talk about how they feel and make them feel safe at the school, something I, as, Pal as a Palestinian student, do not feel. I request that the school do an informational setting for all staff and that the school can better ensure Palestinian culture can be represented throughout the school without having the fear of our flag torn down. Thank you. Next we have Nick uh, Tadik. Good evening, Nick Tadic, parent and resident. Uh, thank you, first of all, for allowing me to review the Niles West Pool uh, project documentation. Uh, I can tell that the scope for this work has been meticulously done by the Studio GC. However, for the winning bid, there are many flaws. Uh, basically, uh, the bottom line is that the cost of this project has been inflated to the level of 1.5 million at least. Uh, how? by uh, basically misspecifying the scope items and duplicating them between the base bid and, uh, uh, and the additional scope. The base bid is being laid out, handwriting chicken scratch, and adds up to only $5.1 million. The, uh, the additional scope actually has the proper way to do it, which is the scope level items. So let's review a couple of items. Uh, first floor vestibule addition is literally the first item in the scope that's been outlined by the, by the studio GC. This is a part of the scope, and this is a part of the base bid of 5.1 million. You approved adding this as the additional scope. By doing so, you inflated this project cost by $600,000 for that line item alone. Let's look at my favorite item, uh, time system. Time system is a part of the base bid. $178,000 clearly laid out. However, the same time system has been added to the, uh, to the added scope, also in the amount of $178,000, which represents the omission on your part. Why do we need two timing system for a non-compliant pool? We don't, we don't need one. So all in all, out of these 10 items, eight of them I was able quickly to find were a part of the scope. And I'm glad to hear the gentleman here who mentioned about transparency and, and making sure that we respond responsibly. I urge you to cancel this project One minute and left. have it done properly. Thank you very much. Next we have Andrea, I believe this is Moldova. Good evening. Uh, my name is Andrea Moldovan. I'm here to ask you again, respectfully, to uh, reconsider the current plan to repair the Niles West Pool and consider expanding the scope of this project to add additional uh, lane space to the existing six lanes. As it stands right now, the plan to repair the existing Niles West Pool is a disservice to our swimming program and our community and diving and uh, water polo programs and our community at large. And it's a very expensive band-aid that does nothing to address the need for more uh, lane space uh, that has 
uh, that's needed as our uh, swimming, diving, and water polo programs have constantly grown over the last years. Uh, going ahead with the pool repairs without expanding the lane space would be a huge missed opportunity as it would mean nothing uh, will be done to provide more space for our swimming, driving, and water polo programs for the foreseeable future. Swimmers invest in an incredible amount of time and energy in this program and we need to strive to provide them with the tools to succeed. Facilities matter and we need to improve our pool for our present and future athletes. Thank you. Next we have Amar Sadiku. <coughs> Hello. As you can see, I'm not here for the pool program, but I do support them in that. My name is Amar Siddiqui. I graduated here in, at Niles West uh, in 2019. I have four siblings that went through the D219 program. Um, and I, I also represent the MEC Masjid as well. I would like to begin with a phrase in the Quran that Muslims believe in that that killing one life is as if you've killed all of mankind and saving one life is as if you saved all of mankind and I think everyone or I hope, I hope everyone can agree to some extent that life is very precious. November 14th, the last time we had a board meeting here, there were about 5,000 children that were killed, 10,000 civilians that were killed, 1 million people that were displaced. And three weeks later, thanks to the U.S., thanks to Zionism, and thanks to everyone that supported that, that number is now, now 10,000 kids that are killed, 20,000 civilians that are killed, and 1.7 million people that, that are displaced. And in Mr. Meyer's history class, we spoke about the Trail of Tears, where 60,000 people were displaced, Native Americans, um, and 60,000 compared to 1.7 million seems very, very much worse, or the other way around. 50,000 are also injured, Most, a lot of who will die of sepsis, blood loss, pain, because there's no pain medications, so they do surgery without any pain medications. There's barely in a hospital, so they're lucky if they do get surgery to begin with. Just imagine 5,000, 10,000 children dead. That's how many school worth, how many Niles West worth of kids is that? It's very hard to imagine, but if you check the news from this morning, that's two schools that were bombed this morning. Imagine if that during African American slavery, during the Holocaust, during Native genocide, that these excuses of, oh, we're doing self-defense, or oh, there's someone hiding underneath some tunnel, under a hospital, or under a school were made. Imagine how, would, how that would have gone down. Those exact excuses weren't made, but excuses were made, and so we see that those things did actually happen, in fact. If One you ever wonder left. how something like the Holocaust could have happened, you don't have to imagine further because you're looking at what's, what the world is doing right now. The way everyone, every single person has reacted, the way the schools react, the statements the schools put out, that's exactly how things like this happen. And then the, the other excuse that's often brought up is anti-Semitism, that, oh, you guys are being anti-Semitic, you can't speak against Zionism, you can't speak against Israel. Um, that doesn't make any sense for a number of reasons, but also we have Jewish people that I stand with in protest on, every, on a weekly basis. We have groups like Ju Jewish Voice, Voice for Peace, we have International Jewish Anti-Zionist ne uh, Network, and many other groups like them. How can a Jew be uh, anti-Semitic to themselves? So this doesn't make sense. And then Malcolm X said something that's very applicable today. He said that if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. And this is not, could not be any more true. When we talk about hate and oppression and the news and the media, we see this picture. Time is up. Uh, that's two minutes. Three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Next we have um, Muhammad Jabbar. Muhammad Jabbar. Uh, I'm a community member. Um, uh, in relation to the students, uh, uh, free speech and rights to express peacefully. I would like to thank the school for allowing our children uh, their right to free speech. Thank you. Next we have Michael Cruz. Good evening, I'm a parent of a girl on the Niles West swim and water polo team, and I'm hoping you heard from the past board meetings where students voiced their concerns about the Niles West pool renovation. A lot of these girls that spoke are juniors and seniors and probably won't be able to experience whatever improvements are done to the pool, but they were still out there voicing their concerns, not for them, but for future students. 
If you look at the number of athletes each of our school district has, there are 60 now north swim, dive athletes, but you have 185 now west swim athletes. Now Swiss, Snell's West swim teams are just gonna get larger based on the thriving swim program we have today. We know we wouldn't tell a football athlete, we don't have enough space in the field to practice, but our sister school does, so we'll bus you there daily. Or something more extreme, we can't provide you the best safety helmets because it wasn't within our budget, so just be careful. We wouldn't tell a football athlete that, so why are we telling our swim and dive athletes their safety isn't as valued as the other sports? These are the kids that fight every day in their sport to represent Niles West. Kids who are looking to thrive and get scholarships in the sport so they can make a difference in the world tomorrow. When the history of the Niles West pool is written and you pass the torch to the next administration and board members, please make a pool where the athletes can strive, a pool where a student doesn't need to get bust so they can balance schoolwork and a sport, Tell the community, we care about the people with disabilities and you can watch the event in the bleachers with the rest of your family. And when the kids grow up, raise a family and give them a reason to move back to the community where they can experience a great swim career versus another neighboring school district that has be better facilities than Niles West. Thank you. Next we have, I believe this is Mark Abrar. Hello, my name is Mark Ambrose. I'm a parent of a current swimmer on the JV, uh, Niles West JV team. Also a parent of a uh, eighth grader that will be entering Niles West <clears throat> next year. And um, you know, I realize what a difficult job it is for you to uh, make proper decisions and with the, with the budget you have to work with to please the uh, entire community. But I think this is a really wonderful opportunity for you to have to improve the plan and build an aquatic center that you can be proud of for years to come. I think you will be really pleased with your decision to do this. Um, because we all know that the, the pool is outdated. We all know that we have to do it at some point so the question of spending you know maybe a quarter or a third of that money on cosmetic work and i know that the reason it was passed was for safety reasons and i i respect that completely so i urge you to uh pass up to, to put this plan on hold and uh regroup a little bit and come up with a really wonderful plan that uh i know you can be proud of thank you Next, we have Ab Abdurrahman Ibrahim. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. My name is Abdurrahman Ibrahim. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasooli al-kareem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa sili amri wa hlil uqtatan min lisani yafqa wa qawli. I graduated from Niles West in 2021. And one of the most life-changing courses I took at Niles West was a course in which we discussed the U.S.'s history of destabilizing the black community, both at a systemic and community level. We talked about the Tulsa massacre and the destruction of Black Wall Street. We were exposed to the horrific Tuskegee experiments. We discussed the lasting effects of systemic racism and why the government won't address issues like redlining, super PAC lobbying, and corporations essentially playing a controlling role in our legislative branch. So now I pose to you this question. If we're allowed to be so critical of our own US history and government at Niles West, why are, students trying to, why are students being silenced on the issue of Palestine? I believe it is more important now than ever for students to be allowed to speak on the atrocities being committed by the state of Israel, regardless of Israel's motives or intent, regardless of whether they were targeting Hamas or not, they have created the infrastructure for genocide. One. They have dehumanized Palestinians by calling them animals and running propaganda, propaganda against them. Two, they have displaced Palestinians and reduced their spaces to ghettos. Three, they have bombed hospitals, destroyed plumbing, prevented the rotting dead from being buried, and destroyed water purification centers. 
With winter approaching, Israel is banking on pathogens to wipe out the Palestinians. Palestinians can die from simple diseases because they don't have access to medicine, they don't have access to clean water, and they don't have access to treat their infections. I believe that this is something that should absolutely be discussed. Do the American thing and continue to advocate for the freedom of speech in the face of repression. Thank you. Next we have um, Andil Patel. Hi, my name is Adil Patel. I'm a Nauz West alum, class of 2021. In light of the current events in the Middle East, it is crucial for our school district to prioritize the safety, peace of mind, and equitable treatment of all of our students, regardless of their background, be it Palestinian or Israeli, Muslim or Jewish. There's a genocide being committed against the Palestinians with thousands of innocent be people being killed, nearly half the number being children. For the first time in history, mass murder is being broadcasted live to us, and while many of us rightly feel horrified, others choose to ignore their pain or even have the audacity to demonize the victims of 75 years of oppressive occupation and a current eth ethnic cleansing. As Malcolm X so rightly stated, and as Brother Omar also mentioned earlier, if you're not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing. As people who care for humanity and are working to build a community and school environment that should be striving to foster this generation into the humanitarian leaders of tomorrow, this matter is of utmost importance and has far-reaching implications that affect us here even in the US. I urge the members of the board and everyone here to first and foremost educate yourselves and understand the truth of the matter. If we hope to ensure a safe school environment for all, it is imperative that we ourselves don't fall prey to the clear biases and media manipulation that is inspiring so much ignorance and hatred, causing a six-year-old boy to be stabbed 26 times to death right here in Plainfield, the shooting of three university students in Vermont just days ago, and so much more. The school needs to facilitate the flow of free speech and allow students to voice their feelings on the issue. Censorship of such free speech will only further distress students who already have such heavy hearts, seeing what is happening overseas and potentially have family members involved. Miko Pellet, Israeli peace activist and author, son of a prominent Israeli general, said Palestinians, particularly in Gaza, are not faced with an option to resist and be killed or live in peace. They're presented with the options of being killed, standing up and fighting, or One being killed, left. sleeping in their beds. Statements such as these are the ones that are, in, are an endorsement to the demands of ceasefire and an end to the occupation. I would like to end by quoting a personality more worthy of commenting on this issue than any of us here a child of Holocaust survivors and a notable personality in regards to this issue. He said, my late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother was, was in Majdanek concentration camp. And it is precisely and exactly because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings that I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. Norman, Norman Finkelstein, thank you. Next we have Hassan Hesseyert. I believe it's Hassan Hesseyert. I'm probably mispronouncing. <laughs> From the speeches heard at the last meeting, I can see that some people misunderstood, or chose to misunderstood, what happened at the sit-in and what it was about. As someone who was at the sit-in, I would like to explain. Students peacefully lined up on the sides of the hallway. In third period, we made a Muslim and a Christian prayer for all the innocent Palestinians in Gaza and the occupied West Bank in East Jerusalem murdered by Israel. How frightening, I know. Slogans were chanted towards the end, such as, Gaza, Gaza, don't you cry, we will never let you die. And from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And they were not hatefully directed at any student or group. There were ultimately two causes for the sit-in. One was in protest of the genocide of Gaza perpetrated by Israel, as well as the ongoing occupation in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. The second was in protest over the school clearly choosing sides in a conflict that they must have known is so divisive. After the October 7th attacks and the subsequent Israeli bombardment of Gaza, the superintendent sent out an email. An email that acknowledged Israeli suffering, 
but not Palestinian suffering. An emo that came at a time when we all heard, when all we heard around us is the news of a uh, all we heard around us in the news was a denial of the suffering and an impression that the Palestinians have endured for decades and we're experiencing now more than ever that Israel began its genocidal war. When we read that email and we saw no mention of Palestinian suffering, it sent a message to our men at Palestinian community that our suffering is not even worth mentioning, that our people's lives don't matter. And it also left us wondering, wondering why suddenly lives matter now. We wondered, where was the email when Masjid al-Aqsa, also known as the Dome of the Rock, was raided by Israel? Earlier this very year and every single year before that, where was the email when Israel began dro was dropping its bombs on Gaza before October 7th? One minute left. Where was the email during the forced evictions of Palestinians in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem? Where were you? Where was the email? Where were you when all this happened? Especially this year, a year that was already becoming the deadliest year for Palestinians before October 7th. That is what we were protesting against. From this, I hope we are able to understand why this didn't happen, why we're frustrated, and to further make this school a true embodiment of diversity and inclusivity where all our students feel heard and welcome. Thank you very much. Next we have Saba Kaiserudin. Good evening. Thank you all for being here and for doing what you do for our children and for all of us. I do support the renovation of the pool um, the way in the way that the, the swimmers and the parents want. And everything I hear about the pool makes me feel like we really should expand it the way they want and let them win and you know support them to win and support them to host proudly and represent all of us. The other thing I wanted to say is thank you for also supporting MANA Club in their deep listening session, MANA Club in their um, sit-in, MANA Club in their recent field trip. I know that some teachers really weren't for that, but a lot of teachers were, and I, I'm grateful that students were allowed to do that because it was really helpful. Um, you are he hearing a lot of pain tonight um, from our community and thank you for being here and for hearing us out. And some things that I would like to advocate for as a District 219 Niles West parent is um, things that will really offer a, a sense of welcome, more welcome. I grew up here on the North Shore and I chose this area because of its diversity, not the area where I grew up, as opposed to the area where I grew up. I would like to see Arabic offered as a language for our students. I would like to see Eid offered as a holiday for our students, both of them, both Eids, please. We've been advocating for this for a long time and it hasn't happened so far, but I would really like to advocate for it. I would like to advocate for a safe prayer space for our children because like, I know that people who have seventh period lunch have a place to pray, but people, Muslim people, Muslim students who don't happen to have lunch seventh period don't. I mean, it, it, it's really not convenient. And then, you know, like in One the beginning left. of the school year, when you offer, when you tell everyone to do extracurricular activities after school, but please know that we want our kids to do these activities and we want them to have a safe place to wash up and pray and not get bullied and sexually harassed by vaping students in the bathrooms after school. The bathrooms are a mess. They're not safe for our students. I don't feel safe. And to have my student there, even though he is there. Um, please clean up the bathrooms. Please offer a safe place for people, Muslim people to wash up and pray. I just feel like more diversity in the staff would really help us to not feel so isolated, so alone, and so frustrated. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> We'd like to thank our 17 participants on today's public comments, students, alumni, parents, staff, and community members for your voices, your engagement, and your concerns for the D219 community. 
Um, all comments are taken under advisement. Next, we have um, our student representatives. Um, first, we'll hear from Zoe, uh, Zoe from Niles West, and next we'll hear from Sam from Niles North. Good evening, members of the Board of Education. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, to start off, I'd like to go over our winter sports. Wrestling and boys basketball just won their first conference game, or me. Actually, both were against Vernon Hills, so I think we're a little bit superior in that way. And girls basketball plays second at their first tournament of the season. Um, as you guys might have heard, Mena had another field trip this year where they went to Na Northwestern and learned about the history and their culture. And I heard they also had some pretty good food there. So um, we are continuing our Wolf of the Month where students are chosen by teachers and staff and are celebrated for their achievements. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight is our girls got volleyball won all conference. So we celebrated senior Molly Eshkin for being a leader in her sport and leading them to a win. Also to lead up to finals week, we have hot chocolates and donuts weekly with the principal to help students relax and more connect. More along with finals week, we have a spirit week from the 11th to the 15th. There are gonna be candy cane sales for dance marathon to support Will's Place. There's gonna be actual like dressing up days where we have students dressed up in either ugly sweaters or hoodies to make them feel comfier and try to lower the stress for finals a little bit. We're trying a new thing this year called Big Red on the Sled, which is our take on Elf on the Shelf, where the different grades get to compete on finding Big Red each day and hopefully sophomores win, just a little personal. <laughs> We're also trying something new with a teacher versus students pickleball tournament on December 10th, and hopefully that'll be fun. And um, Student Gov is sponsoring a Toys for Tots drive where students can bring in new toys for kids, for underprivileged kids who can't access their toys, and that will be collected soon. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Education and District 219 community. This month marks the beginning of the winter sports season and Niles North boys and girls basketball seasons are well underway, as well as, gr as, well as wrestling and girls gymnastics, which hosted their first home meets last week. Um, last month, uh, Dance Marathon hosted the Niles North Variety Show, which was the sh a showcase of students' wonderful talents. The event raised over $650 for their primary beneficiary, Will's Place. Um, a big congrats to the winners, Micah Chan, Eduardo Garcia, and Israel Sotelo, as they earned a chance to perform again at the Winter Pep Assembly. Last week, the Niles North chapter of the National Honor Society inducted over 100 new members at their induction ceremony on November 30th. These dedicated seniors were confirmed and were celebrated for their continued commitment to the four pillars of the National Honor Society, scholarship, service, leadership, and character, as well as volunteering to the Niles North community. Congratulations to the inductees. Next week, the Niles North Fine Arts Department will have its annual collage concert. This winter-themed concert will feature performances from the band, jazz band, choir, vocal jazz, orchestra, and Viking strings programs. There will be a community performance on the 13th during the school day, as well as performances at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. on December 14th. We are getting close to the end of an amazing first half of the school year and we are also approaching as we are approaching the end of the semester we are also, we are also approaching finals finals will take place on Wednesday December 20th through Friday the 22nd from 8 10 to 12 30 with makeup times each of those days from 12 40 to 2 o'clock more information about finals can be found in students emails or on the website before finals Niles North is celebrating the culmination of a great semester with a winter spirit week some of the highlights include Culture Day on Wednesday, December 6th, with our annual diversity celebration happening in the gym after school, and our Winter Pep Assembly on Friday, December 8th. Thank you and good night. Approval of the consent agenda. Does anyone have anything they want to pull 
they have an item they want to pull off the consent agenda. Okay. Um, in that case, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Abraham? Yes. Member <coughs> Wood? Who? Member Wood? Me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Member Dr. Coe? Member Nowick? Yes. Member Durr? Yes. All right. 2023 property tax resolution. Okay, this is finally the last go around on this. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, during the hearing session of the uh, property tax uh, levy, um, last year's extension was, I'm just going to summarize very briefly here. Last year's ex extension was $155,425,033. This year's extent, proposed extension is 166 million, or excuse me, levy request is 166 million nine hundred thirty-two thousand dollars even, which represents a 7.4 percent increase over last year's extension. Under the property tax extension limitation law, uh, the district is uh, allowed to go up to 5 percent for CPI. The actual CPI at the time that it was determined for property tax purposes was 6.5 percent. Again, we're capped at five. The additional 2.4% is for a factor of new property, which is unknown at this time, and won't, we won't be known until after the, uh, the, um, the, uh, the county clerk um, calculates the actual taxes sometime next year. Um, I've attached to the cover letter, you'll see three resolutions. The first one is the actual resolution to approve the property tax resolution as presented. The second resolution is to instruct the county clerk how to apportion the 2023 tax levy extension reduction as presented. What that has to do with is, is if in the event taxes collected don't um, add up to what is anticipated, that deficit in taxes is prorated apportionally amongst the operating funds. Uh, the last resolution is the resolution uh, authorizing the application of monies from levy adjustment for the 2023 levy as presented. What that has to do is um, um, if we get, if the district gets uh, property tax appeals board refunds this next year, that those uh, monies would be placed in the capital projects fund. Any questions at all? Also, on the levy request certificate, you will see that there is zero request for a debt service levy. Point of information, Ken, are we voting on these? Uh, President Durr, are we voting for all of three these three in a group, or are we voting on each of them individually? Each individual. Okay. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, roll call. Uh, Doctor, member Dr. Coe? Member Abraham? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Nowick? Yes. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Durr? Yes. All right, next, can I have a motion for the Board of Education to approve the resolution to instruct the county clerk how to apportion the 2023 tax levy extension reductions as presented? So moved. Second. second. We have a roll call. Member Nowick? Yes. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Dr. Coe? Member Abraham? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Durr? Yes. Finally, may I have a motion for the Board of Education to approve the resolution authorizing application of monies from levy adjustment for the 2023 levy as presented? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Member Dr. Coe? Member Nowick? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Abraham? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Durr? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you very Tim much. And Kenya. Next, we have the peer assistance in review overview. 
um, Dr. Haskins and team. If I could just introduce, this is <clears throat> this is our um, evaluation and deduction model with our new teachers, and it's very unique. It's one of the things when I took over here that I had to learn. I've ne I had never seen anything like it, and um, really observing it through the year, getting to know it, getting the people to lead it. It inspired me so much that when I had somebody else new coming here this year, I made her my liaison to the committee and Dr. Haskins work, works to oversee it. And I think both of us would, um, we wanted to make sure we'd gone over because I looked over records from the board and it hasn't really been described over the past few years or gone over. And it's such an important part of what we do in deciding not just who we hire, but how do we train them, how do we keep them, and how do we bring them into the fold? And then to decide that, yes, this is somebody that we want to, because in our first couple of years, a teacher's exposed to a couple hundred kids. Now we're making promise to, to the thousands of kids that will come after that will get to have that teacher. So with that, Dr. Haskins. Thank you, Superintendent Moore. And if it's okay with you, I will speak from the podium to make space for our special guest speakers this evening. First, thank you for this opportunity to highlight for you and the viewing public one of our district's points of pride in professional growth and development. Uh, here in D219, we subscribe to a model of continuous improvement where we say, you don't have to be sick to get better. Here in our district, we have a plethora of programs and resources that support the professional growth and development of our educators. They include you know, mentor programs, a very strong mentor program. I want to give a nod to that. Um, our educator peer leaders, instructional coaches, and much more. And it's responsive to our educators across a continuum of educational experience from our true first year educators to our most seasoned veteran uh, teachers. So I'm so pleased to have joining with me at the board table, my colleagues who represent um, the various groups that make up the PAR uh, structure, the Peer Assistance and Review Program. That is the program that we want to highlight tonight as one of our model programs for support on um, professional growth and development. Here with me is Mr. Michael Graham, and he is, uh, he co-chairs the PAR panel with me, among being uh, an English teacher. And uh, Evelyn Lauer, also an English teacher, she is a uh, consulting teacher, and she'll talk a little bit about that role. Uh, Diana Yu is representing our curriculum directors, and she is a science department curriculum director. And Matthew Hunter, one of our consulting teachers, is not just here to as a consulting teacher, but he wants to represent the perspective of um, a former, someone who's had a successful experience as a PAR teacher, and now he's paying it forward as a consulting teacher. So this is our agenda, and I'm gonna share my airtime with our special guests as we just outline the salient features of the program. So to begin, what is PAR? It's, it's a colleague to colleague program of assistance, coaching, mentoring, support, development. And it aligns with our state approved evaluation model and all of the components of it. It is an innovative premier program that we know is, only, is the only one of its kind in the state of Illinois. The structure of PAR, so I have a diagram that illustrates how the uh, members and the stakeholders of the PAR program interface with each other. Um, it's largely made up of non-tenured teachers that the PAR consulting teachers and all of the other collaborators support. On rare in rare instances, there might be a veteran teacher, um, a tenured veteran teacher who may self-select back into the program for a variety of reasons, or it may be part of an intensive or assistance um, recommendation for improvement. The PAR panel is made up of five union representatives uh, and four admin representatives, and they are appointed by the superintendent and the union board chair. Our administration includes our curriculum directors. Also, you'll hear about our um, 
PAR panel, our principals this year that make a part of the PAR panel, and of course our consulting teachers. I'd be really remiss if I didn't highlight our mentors and our mentor committee and the mentor program that really support the program and they champion our new teachers. And so I'm going to have Mike go dig into why PAR rationale. So why PAR? Because it's good. Uh, it is a signature program. About 40 years, Al Shanker, who was then the president of the American Federation of Teachers, wanted to implement this program in New York City, feeling that it was a way for such a, a huge district to have an opportunity for new teachers to be brought on board and you know, feel comfortable. Uh, the only other place it was ever implemented before District 219 is in Toledo, Ohio. So we, the, we were the third district in the country. Uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't implemented in New York, I apologize. So Toledo was the first place. We are the second school district. We are the only school district in the state of Illinois uh, that has a program like this. And the idea is, you know, as Dr. Haskins alluded to, you don't have to be sick to get better. Uh, we have, as you all know, an incredible range of experiences uh, among our very talented teachers, and we bring those to bear to help those new to our district. Not just first and second year teachers in the profession, but people who are moving from other districts um, and need to understand how our district does the things it does. Uh, what is most important, in my opinion, and I was a consulting teacher for four years, in the second, third, fourth, and fifth years of the program, and I was honored to be asked back to serve as the co-chair. Uh, but the peer-to-peer -peer collaboration is what is really important. Um, this is not a criticism of curriculum directors. As you may know, the new state law allows for observations of teachers every three years. Our curriculum directors evaluate their, our teachers every year because that's good practice. But when you're talking about departments of 15, 20, 25 teachers, that curriculum director has, those curriculum directors have tremendous responsibility in addition to their responsibilities beyond observing and evaluating teachers. So this allows for colleagues to work with colleagues, for people who have taught that class the year before or two years before, or can tell you who's been teaching that class for 15 years who can support you. Uh, Again, as we always talk about in all the work that we do, the equity lens is so important. Our teachers are intimately familiar with the work that we're doing with equity and can introduce teachers, again, not just newer teachers who tend to have, in some cases, a stronger equity lens because of their recent training and the way that teacher training programs have evolved, but for veteran teachers coming from districts that don't look anything like ours. And we know that there are not districts that look like ours. And I think that's, I said number two was the most important, but I think um, those two go, go hand in glove. Uh, and again, as Dr. Haskins alluded to, we have literacy coaches, we have mentors, we have veteran teachers, all of whom are involved in this process. And these newer te teachers new to our district are being told, everyone's here to support you. Um, we really want you to succeed. Um, as Mr. Moore alluded to, we want you to be here for 10 and 15 and 20 years. We want you to impact thousands of our students. And the only way to do that is to come together at the beginning and say, here's everything you need to be successful here. What more can we do? And that's what the consulting teachers do on a daily basis in collaboration with curriculum directors, the mentor program, and our literacy team. Okay, so I am one of the six PAR CTs, current PAR CTs. This is my second year serving in this role. I've been in the district for 23 years uh, as an English teacher, but this is a super exciting thing to shift in from the classroom into helping teachers teach. And one of the primary roles of um, the consulting teachers is that we are performing the evaluative observations for the first and second year teachers instead of the curriculum directors. We work in tandem with the curriculum directors, and Diana will talk about that in a minute, our collaboration, but we are the ones going into the classrooms and observing teachers. Um, we're evaluating them on their, the way that they plan lessons, 
their classroom environment, their instruction, and their professional responsibilities. And we um, determine that via going into the classrooms and doing formal and informal observations of them and during pre and post observations. The other mm. huge part of what we do outside of evaluations is one-on-one -on -one instructional coaching. And this can take a variety of forms um, of kinds of support. So some of the things that we do are team teaching. We'll go into a classroom with a teacher and we'll kind of co-teach together. Um, it can also look like um, lesson planning support, meetings where we look at unit plans together and backward map lessons and look at specific lessons and um, learning objectives. It can also um, look at joint observations of tenure teachers and then having a meeting afterwards. What did you notice? What are some key takeaways? Um, our coaching supports are very targeted on whatever specific needs are coming up for the individual teachers that we work with. Um, in addition to the coaching, we have to give a, pro like a progress report in October to the PAR panel, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit regarding the teacher's performance. We give them an update. And then in February, which will be coming up soon, we give a summative report that's attached to their summative evaluative rating, which includes that teacher, um, what we've seen in the classroom, but also the 30% of the student growth data, which is part of the SLO and PLC process, which you'll be hearing an update about later tonight. Um, that is also part of the teacher's um, report that we give to PAR panel. And then in February, we also make a recommendation for retainment or release of this teacher. And then the PAR panel votes to either uphold that recommendation or not. So we're the first kind of step in that process. Um, and as we keep kind of reiterating, this is a very collaborative process. Um, we work with the mentors um, and other so teachers who sort of support the par teachers in PAR that we work with, and more specifically, the collaboration between the curriculum directors, and Diana is going to go over that now. So yeah, thank you. Um, I am the science director at Niles North, and I am here to speak about the role of the curriculum directors within the PAR program. And as Evelyn mentioned, for the year one and two teachers, the PAR, our primary evaluator is the PAR consulting teacher, but we work very closely with the PAR consulting teacher um, to support our first and second year teachers. Um, so at a minimum, we will do at least one to two observations together. So we go into the classroom together and do the observation um, together. And then we do a debrief afterwards, um, either in person or by phone, and we speak about the areas of strength and areas of growth. Um, in addition to the debrief, we also fill out an admin input form, and in the admin input form, we provide written feedback on each of the domains that follows the Danielson framework, which we use for evaluation. Um, and then we also give our ratings as well, and that is shared with the PAR consulting teacher as well as the teacher um, and then in, in addition to that, Evelyn spoke a little bit about the professional responsibilities and we call that domain four. Um, we also fill out a professional responsibilities form and we kind of speak on the general professional responsibilities the teacher has. So this includes any classes or courses they took, um, maintaining accurate records, taking attendance, putting in grades, um, how they collaborate with their colleagues. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of communication between the PAR consulting teacher and the curriculum um, curriculum director. I, um, even when the director's not in the classroom, I personally have always received either written or phone call or even in person um, just to provide feedback on what they saw, what they observed, so that we can work together to support our first and second year teachers. For a year after um, they go through the year two, um, they, we do a transition in the spring um, as they transition into the curriculum directors being the primary evaluator. So the curriculum directors um, are the primary evaluators for our year three and four teachers, and we follow the same model. We do two formal um, observations and one informal in collaboration with the school principal. Um, and then we do the same coaching sessions, pre and post observations, and then we are the ones presenting both 
in the fall and in the spring and will recommend for retain or release um, in the February part panel. Um, and the last piece that I want to speak on that's um, specific for this year and years um, coming, the, um, we do, the directors do oversee the slow and PLC work, but we collaborate with the PAR consulting teacher to rate the student growth. Can you say component. what that is? For the viewing public, SLO and PLC. Yeah, so I think there we're going to be speaking on it, but it's the student learning objectives. So we're, we're talking about the student growth component that we've been working on during our late starts this school year. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the PAR panel itself consists of five teachers and four administrators. Uh, the five teachers are appointed by the union president, and the uh, four administrators by the superintendent. And again, the reason this is important is what we're talking about. Uh, one of the things I wanted to allude to as well um, is that the consulting teachers don't work in isolation. They problem solve together so that when they're dealing with teachers who may be struggling or teachers who need extra support or teachers who are thriving, who could serve as models for their colleagues, um, there's collaboration there. But then when we get to this you know, very serious and important decision about someone's career, about someone's um, continuation with our district or transitioning to another place where they might be better suited to teach or perhaps another profession that, to which they might be better suited, you've got these nine members of the PAR panel who are hearing objectively the information that's been observed uh, and making that decision. Uh, one thing that needs to be noted here is decision, any decision about retention or release uh, needs a vote of six members. So you, we wouldn't have a situation where five teachers would say we want to retain and four administrators want to release. And no decision is made until we reach that number of six. I think that's important. So we do hear these progress reports, which we heard in October. Um, we ask a lot of questions. It's a real challenge for the consulting teachers because we, as I said, see things objectively. So, you know, it's a question of tell me more about that observation. Tell me more about that thing that you saw that, you know, the teacher is working on. And then when we come back in February, the question is, how did that go? We return to those questions of how is this teacher progressing? Um, and the last piece is we make those recommendations about retention or renewal to you as the board to make a final decision. Uh, but please understand when those decisions come to you, there has been a tremendous amount of work that went into that recommendation. And sometimes it's difficult. There are teachers who work very hard, who are very committed, who really care about kids. And this is just not the district where they're going to be able to continue their careers. And what is always at the center of all of this is what's best for students. So after hearing all this information about this program, you might be asking yourself, so what? What do you get out of a program like PAR? Well, you could get someone like myself. I came to this district in 2016 uh, with six years of experience, uh, but I needed more confidence in my teaching. Through my PAR experience, I wasn't sick but I did get better. I was able to teach in a way that empowered students with skills they didn't know, some of them didn't know they could have or that they can learn. And I watched them be successful in and outside of the classroom. Over my years as a PAR teacher, I watched my students compete at a regional acapella competition where they placed first, second, and third, and advanced into the semifinals that year. I watched my arts appreciation class put on a production of The Lion King that this district has never seen, that highlighted the gifts and the skills of our special education department, and now it's West High School. I watched as my former student, Kenan Ozer, recent graduate uh, engineering student from the University of Illinois, he participated in the National Honors Chorus in Orlando, where we all, myself and his parents, flew to support him after he had been recognized by this state as one of the top male singers by the Illinois Music Educators Association. So, as I mentioned, all of this happened while I was in the PAR program. And now as a PAR consulting teacher, I understand what it means to meet the teachers where they are. 
and help them develop confidence in their abilities and the development of the most effective teaching practices. In this picture, you'll see me performing with my students at the St. Lawrence Market in Toronto, Ontario. This was the first time I took a group of students abroad, but I knew that I was ready. And more importantly, I knew how to get my students ready to represent themselves and our district on an international level with excellence and pride. Thank you, Matthew, for, you, Matthew, for your personal reflection and all that you do in service to equity for all children. I, um, before we close, I just wanted to bring some other voices and acknowledge some other reflections um, that have contributed to the program, but that has also um, contributed to the district showing evidence of um, you know, our national state and our state and national rankings and all of these points of pride and accolades that you mentioned here. Um, here's one from our, um, our union president in D219. Um, this is the Northern uh, Suburbs Teachers Union. Uh, this unique mentoring and evaluation program helps teachers new to our district become more effective quickly because of the consistent and meaningful feedback they receive from veteran colleagues. It's about teachers learning from and supporting one another. I think it's important to give voice to this. Evelyn. I fully credit my experience with making me the teacher I am today. It's continuous cycle of support, feedback, reflection, and opportunities for collaboration with my consulting teacher was an incredible experience that I wish every teacher had a chance to be a part of. I highly value this type of onboarding because it helps me recognize my strengths and focus on ways to improve. Those are true testimonials. And so we want to close with a quote from Charlotte Danielson. She's an expert in evaluation. It's the evaluation model that we use here in our district. And you've heard a lot about the adults, right? But this program centers students. The single most important influence on student learning is the quality of the teacher. And so now we'd like to open the floor for questions and answers. Hi. Yes, um, just some quick questions, uh, and you may have ans um, answered this, but how are the, um, the mentors and the mentees paired? How does that process work out? I think it works different in every department, okay. but often the director works in collaboration with the teachers who are in the department currently and tries to like pair it. Sometimes mm -hmm. there's recommendations or suggestions of like, I would like to work with this person because um, former relationships, sometimes former students that teachers have had that now have come back to us um, as colleagues. Um, and so it's it's dependent, but usually it's a conversation and there's thought into it, not just, and, and <coughs> someone has to volunteer to be the mentor too, to give their time. And then um, you had mentioned that there's one-to-one -one instructional coaching. Is that per request from that um, teacher or is it based on like observations where, okay, there's some area and maybe I, we need to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching? a little bit of both um, and Matthew chime in to, uh, it, it, to follow up with this but sometimes we as PAR consulting teachers it, it, it will come up of I think that this would be benefit for us to have sign up for a coaching session I'm really gonna re, you know request that you meet with me to let's go over your lesson plans mm -hmm. other time a teacher will be drive it and say I would like to meet with you because and so sometimes when we look at coaching sessions it might be an excellent teacher who's just trying to get better and they're taking advantage of the resource that they have other times it's driven more because of need I would agree sometimes a teacher will have something come up at the last minute and I've received like a phone call say can I talk to you for a quick minute about what I'm getting ready to do in this class so sometimes we'll be able to talk you through your approaches um, and allow you to kind of feel a little bit more confident going into a situation where you want to experiment with something different. So um, it, it happens in different ways. And then just lastly, um, when, when is 
when do um, the mentors and the mentees get to get a chance to meet? Because I can imagine with so many initiatives, like you're so busy. So when do you have that time to, um, to meet? Um, I just want to clarify, are you asking about, because the mentors and consulting teachers yes. serve different roles. Okay, so I'm, 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 I mean the mentor and the mentee, you yes. know, and the new and teacher, when do they get to collaborate? Um, generally they, well, first of all, they're invited to every collaboration that the, the teacher has with the consulting teacher. Pre-observation conferences, observations, post-observation conferences, coaching sessions. So those are scheduled. So those are scheduled okay. and the mentor is invited to all of those. Got it. Some teachers will say, you know, I would like to have the mentor at these things, but not these things. And it is a big commitment on the part of the mentor. That's why, as Evelyn said, people have to volunteer. And they know with PAR, it's very different than when I had a mentor 30 years ago. The expectations were very different. You know, here's the copy room. Here's, you know, the, you know, the logistics of, of this class. But now it's much more intensive. So... And sometimes they have a shared prep period where they can, can meet and collaborate, but if they do not, a lot of times they do meet before or after school. And there's a full week at the beginning of the school year, new teacher orientation, and the mentors are, are there as well, and that's part of the training as they go through that with their mentor. I made the mistake in my second year uh, in PAR of referring to, we were at, at that that set one of those sessions, I referred to the process as grueling. And as soon as the word came out of my mouth, I was like, I don't know how many of these people are heading for the door, <laughs> but it is, it's intensive, so. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a, an awesome program. Um, anything that we can do to, to empower, to support, to motivate our students on their educational journey, um, the teachers are the lifeblood of that happening. Uh, and I think it's awesome that we have a program of continuous improvement and support like this. Um, I believe you had mentioned earlier we're the only district in the state of Illinois with the program. Is there a reason why something like this isn't adopted more broadly? I think there is resistance, um, sometimes among department directors or chair people because our directors are asked to you know, give up a lot of what they have traditionally been doing, which is to you know, bring their teachers along. So I think that's one reason. Um, another reason is, um, I'll state the obvious, it's not, a, it's not an inexpensive program. Uh, we're taking classroom teachers out of the classroom um, for this purpose. And as Evan, Evelyn alluded to, there are six teachers this year, um, and I think a lot of districts are hesitant to do that. As we've said, it's an investment in the next 30 years. And we've been fortunate that the board and the administration have always supported that. That, you know, it's a short-term short investment uh, that pays dividends over the long term. And neighboring districts are seeking us out yes. more and more as we're building networks and collaborating across the region more people are intrigued by it. And I think there's a, there's a greater interest in deprivatization of practice. Um, and, and, you know, this has cultivated just an appetite and gratitude for feedback that promotes uh, growth rather than feeling judged. You know, studies show that one third of all teachers um, hired in our public schools, they resign by year three. And so we wouldn't tolerate that kind of dropout rate with our students. And so we can't tolerate it and we have to do something to promote it within our education workforce. Now, one other question. I, seeing that it's not broadly adopted because uh, there is resistance, is there any uh, metrics or data out there comparing districts that are using this to um, those that aren't in terms of outcomes? Like we, we know this is paying dividends, um, but is there actual data that we can use to uh, convince people? <laughs> right. And I think right now we've largely studied the impact of the evaluation model and, um, you know, retention and the development. 
of our teachers and their practice and the outcomes, the impact that it has on the students. Um, as we start to learn more and network with other districts, that's something that we'll study and follow and be happy to report back on our findings. Awesome. I have a question. Um, thank you very much. This is like fascinating and I'm glad you could highlight it more and go into the specifics from all the different stakeholders. Um, I was curious to, I'd like to hear more about um, newer teachers who are newer to the district but have veteran teaching experience and also about the veteran teachers who are um, making use of the PAR program that you alluded to for different different I reasons. Just make one comment. I, I mm -hmm. think you because I, I think of it this way. We hire teachers who know the content. They're experts in what they've learned in their education. And then they need to learn our curriculum, the way that we teach particular units of study or courses. And then I think the most important is knowing the culture. And I think what's different about PAR is that we can help newer teachers, whether they're new to the profession or veterans who have taught in other places, the culture of District 219, which as we all know and, and can't be said enough is so unique. And that's why I think it's so important is the needs of those 15 year veterans are gonna be very different than someone right out of a bachelor's degree program. But it's about the culture of District 219. And that's why I think what we do is so important. And yeah, and just to just that. to echo that, I mean, I think too, just like we differentiate for our students as PAR CTs, we differentiate for the teachers on our caseload. So a teacher who's right out of college is going to get different. The support that I provide that teacher might look a lot differently than if I have a teacher who has um, 15 years of experience is coming in. But as Michael said, even if they have 15 years of experience and was an excellent teacher in another district doesn't necessarily always translate to that they understand our population of students. And so some of that work might be equity work or conversations about what it means to be a teacher in 219. So there is a lot of differentiation. And then in terms of your second question, I think you asked about t tenure teachers who come back into PAR. I'm gonna let Michael take that because that's more of a rare situation yeah, so in my knowledge i've worked when i was a consulting teacher i worked with two tenure teachers um, and their directors felt that their teaching was they weren't growing in the way that they needed to um, and so this was part of their remediation plan they didn't self-select and it was among the most rewarding experiences of my career because both teachers came in very resistant angry frustrated frightened um, these were people with 20 years of experience at the risk of losing their jobs. And uh, one of those teachers, if, if I told you who that person was, many of the people in this room who know the leaders in our district uh, would be surprised at, at that. And, and the other teacher was close to retirement, but was fully committed to making sure that they left this district uh, doing the kind of work we needed them to do. But it was hard, um, and, and it, you know, it, but it was really rewarding um, to hear directors say, thank you so much, this is a different teacher. This is the teacher that I knew five years ago, and now they're back to being that teacher. Uh, Along those lines, if I, if I could just follow up with that, and, and it kind of follows up yours, because my conversations, what I found last year in these deep conversations, trying to find a quantitative measurement of teaching effectiveness has been a holy grail for 50 years that keeps failing. Every, every new assessment model has a numbering system for teachers or a forward system or a letter grading system or pay incentives. They don't work. They continuously don't work. Millions and millions of dollars are spent on these valuation systems and 10 years later they shift to something that existed at the beginning of my career and i'm just trying to be honest about that that's what i have seen the difference here that's an ancillary benefit with those coming in and i i don't know if you'd agree from our conversations last year is it allows these conversations that exist between teachers and administrators in a setting where we establish what we stand for where we establish this is what's okay for our kids 
This is what we demand. And it's not me saying it, and it's not administrators saying it, it's not just colleagues in a back room talking about colleagues. This is the leaders of our evaluation system coming together and saying, this is who we need to be as professionals. And that standard, I think, continuously gets reset every year through these discussions with the core principles staying the same, but these additives. And I don't know, I don't want to speak for any of you, but that was my biggest takeaway last year. And, and I think just to, just to elaborate upon that, um, we are now responsible to our colleagues. No one can point to a curriculum director or a chairperson and say, that person hired this person and you know didn't mentor them properly, and now they taught this freshman class and I have to reteach these things to sophomores because that person didn't do what they needed to do. And now that finger doesn't get pointed at someone else, it gets pointed back at us. Um, and I think that's a really powerful element of this, is being answerable to and for our colleagues in ways that doesn't exist in other places. And it's easy, and I can say this as a 30-year veteran, sometimes to dismiss the feedback of someone who doesn't do what I do every day. But when someone says, I taught that class last year, I taught this unit last year, and this is what I think you need to work on, it sounds very different. And when your colleagues are holding you to that standard, it feels very different. Member Nowak. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the wonderful um, presentation. I think that was the most thorough presentation I've seen about PAR in the eight years that, that we've been on the board, right? <laughs> and uh, so thank you, Superintendent Moore, for presenting this. It, my, so my first ask is, can you send me that deck so I could memorize some of this stuff when people <laughs> talk to you about PAR? But uh, what I meant to uh, ask is, um, you know, the, the philosophy of Dr. Deming and continuous improvement has been driven into me since I was in college in the last century. <laughs> but it was, the, it was the last quarter of the last century. Who's counting? Yeah, who's, who's counting? Um, so my one ask is, is there a continuous improvement loop where the teachers get to evaluate the process and make recommendations on improvement of the actual PAR process itself? Yes. There is? Okay. I mean, we're, we're in the middle of one right now, but um, I think that's something that we as a team are constantly improving our practice and also improving the um, evaluation model that we're using. I mean, my team just looked at the pre-observation form and that's we're sending a proposal to the DEC next week. So it's like we're in constant like looking at it. the other thing that and just to, a nod to what's coming later, that late start time that we had, we are looking at district evaluation data during that time as a team of the six of us and looking at trends and that has been super impactful and i think in terms of data that was being asked for stay tuned because i think there's going to be some powerful information that now as par cts we have time to actually look at that data for the first time because of that time so hopefully um, as we continue our work together um, you will have some really powerful information about the kinds of um, impact on students, um, but also what 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 is that evaluation data showing that teachers actually need that then impacts our students. And I, I, I also want, if I may, to point out that uh, nearly half of our teachers have now been through the PAR process. And as you know, with the retirements that are upcoming mm -hmm. uh, within the next decade, almost every one of our teachers will have gone through PAR. And so I think teachers who have been through it and have seen its evolution are very willing to share their insights about what they see changing for the good and what you know, might need to be changed as well. So we have, you know, and, and now those teachers are mentors. They have been through PAR themselves and now they're mentoring teachers who are going through it. And, and consulting teachers. And we're not just looking, Joe, for tell us the good stuff you love about this. Um, I, I do want to say any teacher that was not brought back last year, I met with, I know Michael met with, talked about the process, what didn't work, what did work, so that we can refine and look at, okay, 
how do people feel? How do we go through this so that so that it is constantly evolving so it can get better? We're not just trying to be in a positive feedback loop. I think also, I'm sorry. Also to to that point, how we the part consulting teachers that we have are also part of the <laughs> process of improvement. I became a PAR consulting teacher because my PAR CT recommended and said you would be a really good PAR CT. And I thought she was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but she began the jury's to still out. <laughs> <laughs> but then she she was the one who began to identify parts of my teaching and parts of the things that I did in the classroom that needed to be shared or that she felt that I could help coach someone through. Um, I came to some of my observations, my first observation, because I was leery as a, not a first year, first year. I came with some years experience. I thought they were gonna treat me like a first year teacher. So my first observation, I came with my own Danielson framework and what it looked like in the fine arts and gave that to my part CT. And I said, I just want you to know, this is what it's gonna look like when you come to see me. But what it ended up being, it was such a collaborative experience where we learned and talked about the Danielson together. And then after my experience of becoming a part CT myself, I now inform uh, more informed practices based off of my own experience, based on the things that I know I needed as a teacher, I provide for my teachers now without them even asking because I was once in their shoes. He's not just the Danielson president, he's the Danielson <laughs> client. <laughs> was there another question? Yeah, um, I just want to say like Joe, I think this was probably the best presentation and I think we've seen like three or four in the last couple of years. So thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I'm a huge advocate of anything that's talent improvement and development, um, and that's one of the reasons why I love this program. But I would, as a board member, like to go around and tout like how great our numbers are in retention. So I think that that would be something really valuable to have in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so I'm much. sorry. And Ms. Oh, oh member one. Member oh. one. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Pass is not dismissed. Uh, not yet, not yet. Um, so as, as somebody who considers themselves a lifelong learner, I think this is fantastic, right? The fact that you are demonstrating before your students that teachers learn as well, I think is a fantastic model. To that end, I'm wondering what kind of training do the, um, do the CTs have? Like what kind of supports and educational uh, allowing for unbiased or, or non-biased direction and criticism, or not criticism, uh, a value of support is in place to make sure that you all are successful. That is such a great <laughs> we all we all have to take the Danielson training that the state in order to uh, evaluate teachers. That so is that's grueling. Like that, and I would use the word grueling, grueling there. <laughs> that is definitely so the appropriate that, use yeah, of that yes. word. So that has that's the first step. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of professional development um, opportunities within the district. Like whatever whatever I'm encouraging my teachers to take, I try and take too. So like for example, last year. Um, I took restorative practices as a teacher and then took restorative practices too. Then I encouraged all of my um, teachers on my caseload to take it and then we would meet for coaching sessions afterwards with key takeaways and how you're implementing it into your classroom. Um, and so the same kind of professional development opportunities that the district offers for everyone. Uh, also, there's when we see PD that we would like to go to, um, Rosine has been supported of that. We are uh, attending um, some PD um, coming in the spring. I mean, I, I do think it's an area of growth in terms of um, how to support the PAR CTs in the evaluation process because it is a difficult task to step outside of the classroom and um, evaluate. Coaching is one thing, but evaluation is a whole other. Um, and then making the recommendation for retainer release adds another layer of, to it. So speaking as somebody who's been through one year of the cycle and is in the middle of the second cycle right now, um, I, I do feel that we're not administrators and that makes this part of the job. It's, it's very challenging, it's rewarding, but can be very challenging. And I think also there's a somewhat of an unspoken request where us as CTs, we're modeling what we want our teachers to do. So we too are self-motivated to find professional development that will help us do our jobs better. 
Uh, Evelyn, I think, and myself have both already done professional development this semester alone in the middle of our observations. Um, so we tend to kind of uh, support each other and saying, oh, do you want to go here? Do you want to go here? These are some options, but we are pretty self-motivated to make sure that we are staying on the top of our practice as well so that we provide the, the top service that we can for our teachers. And they are also evaluated using the modified Danielson rubric. Uh, so they go through a pre-observation conference, an observation of their practice, lots of reflection, lots of good feedback, and then we try to determine like what's needed in terms of continuous growth. And the, overall, the program is really truly capacity building too among all of our educators. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank now you, you can go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. One of I've the, never uh, felt so tall as sitting in this chair. <laughs> I kept trying to figure out how to move it down to see my actual height, but I couldn't. Uh... I told them to leave you the booth. <laughs> well, thanks. I'm glad you took away the telephone book. It made me feel a little better. <laughs> One of the um, golden nuggets from the IASB conference that we all attended uh, a few weeks ago um, and if I'm quoting it right, it's um, accountability and feedback without support feels like harassment. Yes. And um, I'm glad to see that we're investing in having the right support for our educators. Um, next on the agenda is the Nows West swimming pool discussion. Tim and team, take us away. Hello again. Um, again, my name is Tim Newell, I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Business. I'm joined by uh, um, Ethi Tufexis, who is an architect for Studio GC, and Sarah Kowalski, who is our Director of Operations. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about the pools lately and, you know, where we're at and where we may go. Um, I think everybody is familiar with the basic scope of what's on the table right now, the $7.3 million renovation of the pool, which includes in major pieces um, um, fixing the deck fixing the deck itself uh, repairing the tiles or replacing the tiles replacing the concrete or fixing the concrete underneath the vessel of the pool um, getting better ADA handicap accessibility what else am I missing um, addressing much. some health life safety items eliminating um, non-compliant catwalks things of that nature so that's you know that's that's the basic big parts of the scope of what we're we were talking about now. Um, Ethi went to the drawing board a number of times, and we've got some other options here that the board may want to consider if if the board does want to go in a different direction. Because if we if we're not going to do what we're planning on doing now, we need to start thinking about what are we going to do then. I mean, we've got to do something. So, um, Athi, if you want to go through, we've got well, three different mm -hmm. options other than what we have already on the table. Sure. So these are, as um, Mr. Neubauer mentioned, three alternate options um, looking at ways to expand the pool and not just renovate the existing pool. So the first option would look at an expansion to the west. Okay. So in this model, thank you. In this model, the existing pool um, would stay in its current footprint, and that would be converted to a diving um, diving pool, and then another pool that can be used for physical welfare. And the proposed addition would include an expansion for an eight-lane, 25-meter, uh, 25 25-yard 25 pool that would have a movable bulkhead in order to expand the offerings to an eight-lane competition pool. Um, existing building ends right about here so everything to the left of this area is a proposed additional square footage um, the this option would essentially allow the current scope to remain as is in this area and then it would um, provide an opportunity in the future possibly to add on this additional scope um, it would also allow for continuous use of a pool that would limit some of the um, downtime of not having a pool facility at all at the at the school 
this option here um, would be an additional about eighteen and a half million dollars estimated construction costs in addition to the current seven point three um, that the yes no no go ahead member no. Sure. Yes. Because I mean, right, right now, one of the issues I heard from the water polo was the shallow end is is that adequate for polo, and people are cheating, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> correct. Yes. Yeah. So that the budget number accounts for that cost. Obviously, these are preliminary concepts, mm -hmm. so those details would be would be developed with with the school. Athy, can I? Yes. So, so to clarify, if we had the current renovation scope and considered this as an option um we would do basically both things right with the idea that we would go ahead, go forward with the renovation and then look to uh the expansion or extension following up to that correct okay just want to make correct. sure i understood that basically and this then, is one of the benefits of something like two i'm sorry go ahead go ahead i mean basically this is just turning it into phase two right so, phase one what we intended to do phase mm -hmm. two Right. So with this uh, secondary space, um, what's that going on top of? Like, um, are we losing a tennis court? Are we, is that just grass? Like what's happening right there? Grass. grass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a concrete plaza right here and one large tree and then grass. <laughs> so does, <laughs> all right, friends. Um, so does that affect any kind of green space ordinances or anything that we're following under? We would need to provide stormwater detention as part of this project for any, any addition because is we are impacting over the re required, um, the impact square footage. Okay, so with that space, with that piece of it, is that calculated into that calculation yes, as well? Is. So that is, that's included in yes. that extra, whatever million, extra millions it is. Okay, Correct. thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, the existing scope, we're looking at about, what, about half a year of downtime with the pool, Correct. more or less. If we excavate the existing pool and, you know, widen it or whatever, and she's gonna get into this, that'd be more like a year type of thing. Right, about 12 to 14 right. months. Okay. Yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. um, if we follow it in two phases, as where this sounds like it would be, we would complete the first pool um, during the construction of the expansion. Would it be still be a usable pool at that point, or will it be closed? There would be minimal downtime because there are some touch points in this option we'd be eliminating the exterior wall here because you're having competition swim or water polo in this well of water and then competition diving here. So this whole facility functions as kind of one mm -hmm. combo facility, um, but we would look to sequence that downtime to over a summer or a non-season. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on this side? The other concept we looked at was um, a larger expansion, again, taking further west. This would start encroaching on some of the play areas of the school. So this concept looks at creating two um, separate facilities. So this would stay, the existing pool um, footprint would stay as is with the scope that's currently intended, and it could function as its own um, separate facility, let's say, for physical welfare or warming up or cool down. And then in addition, that would be larger in size, would accommodate all, accommodate all of your competition activities. So this would have eight lanes, 25 meter, 25 yard with a movable bulkhead. And then the diving well for diving competitions would move to this addition portion. Um, this obviously is a larger addition. Um, it does provide the school the ability to kind of segment this off from the rest of the building if that's so desired for any activities. Um, obviously with the additional scope, there is additional cost. So this option would have an addition about 29.6 million in addition to the current renovation costs allocated to this portion of the existing pool. Um, similar to option A, this concept would allow this pool to stay um, in operation and usable while the addition construction was being sequenced with some off-season sequencing of some of these touch points. Remember Noah. Okay. Do you want me to go back? Yes. Mm -hmm. Option A versus option B. Let this go. Let's close and 
having that diving area completely separate uh, versus having a combination here? Sure. Um, so option A, a pro would be a smaller footprint, less impact area, less cost. Um, a difference would be in how your spectators observe. You would have uh, diving that would likely have spectators from the existing bleachers, whereas your competition swimmer water polo would likely want to use the new spectator seating in the addition. Um, as far as pool filtration systems, et cetera, it would be similar in the two options. Option B um, has all of your spectators in the same area. That would be a pro, but again, that would come at additional cost and land impact um, and encroachment on the playing fields for the school. This setup is similar to what Niles North has, just for comparison purposes of context, how swim meets may be run there. Okay, so basically it's 40% more expensive for the combined viewing. Is that for this option correct okay correct right because the addition this about all of this area here is additional okay, okay. thank you mm -hmm. Oops. was there an Going option the way yes okay. <laughs> so the third option we looked at um as we know there have been questions about expanding the pool to eight lanes the existing egress um, restrictions of the building would not give us enough width to just expand the existing footprint of the pool to the west for an additional two lanes. Um, that would encroach on the existing exterior wall and it would provide no deck space if it, it, it would even fit. So we looked at how we can minimize the footprint of a uh, necessary addition in order to provide eight lanes. So this concept here essentially rotates the pool 90 degrees. Um, it would oh. require complete reconstruction of the tub, let's call it. Um, but this would be one way of getting eight lanes and still providing more duct space. The area to the south and the east um, is the existing deck space width though. So there are some concessions um, in this option with the deck availability. Yes. So option C looks like it would be the only one that would require us to um, cancel our current contract. The other two, we have the scope to do the pool as per the agreement, and then it would be additional uh, package going out for either A or B. This one would require canceling this contract and getting this out for bid, correct? Correct. Okay. So what's the total cost? <laughs> total cost of this option would be about 22 million construction. Um, and then we've added the approximate sunk cost of about $970,000. Uh, $970, so, could you explain the 970 versus the five, 500? Sure. So 570 is um, Stuky for their construction costs, which include material as well as labor um, and overhead costs that have already been incurred so far in the project. The other about $400,000 are A&E fees that have already been expended on this project. And with a scope change of this magnitude, a lot of that would be work that would need to be redone and rethought, essentially, that could not transfer over. Option C would mean that the pool would be shut down for how many months? So in this option, um, well, in any of the options, we would be looking at about nine to 12 months of design and permitting time. Mm -hmm. um, construction, probably about 12 to 14, 12 to 15 months, depending on the option. Um, so that would be about a year, year and a half that there would be no pool facility at Niles West. Um, are, we, are we ready to talk big? all three now or are we talking okay excuse me then okay but okay I have a question so a is 18 million additional B is 30 million additional C is 12 million additional right or 16 16 million additional is that correct
15 million additional or what? The original. Yes, correct. Okay, yes. Right, right. Correct. And not only that, we're, we would be losing some investment here. Yeah. Um, so historically on projects of this magnitude, um, the decision of making it on the spur of the moment option A, B, and C on the board typically doesn't happen. What I would propose is that these options, if we decide to move with any of these options other than what's currently on here, would be brought to facilities, have a thorough vetting of that with all the shareholders, come to the facilities, uh, voice their concerns, have the code. And, and, and this, this is what we did at the Niles North uh, expansion. This is what we did at uh, so that we can get all the shareholders input. And I, I feel we'll be doing a disservice of making a call on, on a presentation that we just saw five minutes Didn't ago. Didn't the facilities this has never been this, this has issue. never been presented to facilities in this so, manner. Well, the only issue is that if you, I mean, that's why it's the motion is the way it is because we have a time issue about canceling a contract that's right. out there. So you can discuss if you want to move forward with A or B and discuss those options. If the options, but if we, so there is an element of this. Whereas there is a time pressure, correct me if I'm wrong, Athy, where our contract is out. And if we don't make that choice, we are going to lose that money that's already out. It's December 5th. We have a whole month. Construction is scheduled to start on January 2nd. Yes. So. But, but my understanding is if we choose option A or option B, that construction can start. Exactly. On the existing yeah, that's pool. what I'm trying to Correct. say. So option C makes it such that we'll have to go out and get. So, a, a Joe, I would book. I would suggest that maybe our conversation tonight focuses on three choices, right? One, move ahead as as originally planned. Two, explore, move ahead and explore options A or B, or three, explore option C. Um, I, I'm personally not in favor of option C. I don't think it gains us a whole lot of real estate. I agree. Okay. Um, I, I think that if we are, so coming into this meeting tonight, I was struggling because I, I hear what the families are saying. I hear what the swimmers are saying, but one, one or two of the swimmers actually, it stuck with me the most. I'm standing on tiles that are disintegrating under my feet. I'm getting cut on rusty lane runners. That to me is health and safety. That to me is stuff that has got to be addressed. And it's these fundamental underpinnings that this intended renovation was meant to do. So this whole like, don't move forward with the renovation, it, it, it's problematic to me because I do think that there are significant problems that do need to be addressed because again, and I'm gonna sound like a broken record by the end of my term, my kid with any luck will have exactly one freshman year. My kid with any luck will have exactly one sophomore year. And so that means any time that year that my kid is standing there with the tiles disintegrating under his feet is time that's lost to him and that's that set of students. And I just wanna make sure that while we are planning for a better future, we're thinking about the kids for today as well. So were, uh, were I to have my druthers, I would suggest that we would move forward with the, the renovation as proposed and explore um, we've learned our lessons, um, or at least this board has learned its lesson, so that we will listen and um, take feedback on the other options in terms of A and B about whether or not we move forward in what capacity with that, right? It, we've heard a lot of people speaking about um, doing it the right the first, doing it right the first time. We're gonna do it right the second time. We're gonna make sure that we get the, the input from the, the end users. Um, I am assuming that Tim and Athy and, and Sarah, nobody has seen this except for us at this point that we haven't solicited. Okay. Um, so I, I, I agree with Joe that any bigger conversation does need to go back to facilities to vet and, and properly have that conversation as is appropriate to a, com a subcommittee. Um, well, 
right now, I think, I don't want to speak for everyone, but it's a foregone conclusion that we're expanding the scope. That is something that we can decide on today. Yeah, I, I believe. That we're going to expand the scope, regardless of what option. I believe oh. that uh, the public has made it clear that if we truly want to provide our students with a water polo, diving, and swimming teams full access, that we need to expand to a second pool, the single pool alone even with two extra lanes will not provide the adequate needs that they currently have. So, so I, do, I do want to take a set in, second and clarify and make sure we're managing expectations appropriately. Do I think we need to go back and look at the intended scope and hear the feedback from the end users in terms of the, the students and the coaches? Absolutely. Are we making a decision today about expanding the scope and adding a, a, an addition to the pool? We are, we are not. And I want to make sure that then, nobody thinks that that's a, a, a foregone conclusion. And what are we doing about the contract? <clears throat> well, as I had suggested, I, I think that our discussion perhaps could focus more on whether or not option C is an option. If it is an option, then we need to have a much bigger conversation here. If it's not an option, then in my mind, we can move forward with the current renovation and take the other two options back to the facilities committee, get user input, get community uh, conversation, and understand what those next steps need to look like. Because in, in Joe, as the chair of the facilities committee, correct me if I'm wrong, this also has to fit into kind of the bigger plan and sequencing of the different pieces that are coming up along the capital expenses yeah, plans. There may be a domino effect based on dollar value to see if certain so things are So we wanna make sure that we're fitting it in properly, that right. we're gonna seek those same kinds of additional um, you know, if we're going to do things at the same time, let's make sure we're getting that additional cost savings, right? Anything we can do to help kind of ring a penny here, right? I just, I want to make sure that we're managing expectations that no one thinks that in January there's going to be a new pool being dug. I, I, I just want to be real clear about that. <laughs> okay. Why is it on the agenda for... It, so, what, why it's on the agenda is if you wanted to cancel, if you wanted to have a motion basically to go to C. option C or to cancel the whole thing and start the whole process again, you would need to do that now because we're doing the renovation. The renovation can be paired with another addition. Right. You don't I, have to I, make I, I that I get decision that part. Now. A and B can be paired yes. with it, right? So, right. so we yeah. think C has an option. I don't think not it's to me, but not I don't speak on behalf yeah. of the board. I am one of seven. I've been trained real well to say that. I'm, I am one of seven. I do not speak on behalf of the board. In my mind, in my votes, I would not. I do not see C as an option. We don't gain any real estate. I don't estates. think anyone sees C as viable. Right. Okay. Well, okay. then let's do thumbs up and move on with our lives. And before we do, though, can I just? I just want one clarifying point. I'm not trying to go back, but I don't want people to think that Athi can develop plans in eight days because these were presented. I mean, this this basically, Athi, this isn't new. This has gone before. I mean, this topic has been discussed for years. As a concept. These plans correct. as concepts were discussed previously, correct? correct. I just and that's all they are. They're just concepts. They're so not I don't want people to think that this plans. is some... So to clarify, oh, thrown together. So to clarify, Tom, this was what came before the facilities committee previously and was decided that the renovation was going to happen? It was only discussed previously as a concept. There were not plans or anything formalized. Understood. Correct. Okay. So it, it didn't even get that far. Correct. Got it. Well, just, just so I'm clear on my vote, if we go with either option A or B, our current contract does not have to be voided. We can continue processing that pool, not have any penalties, not have to go out for a new bids or anything. And then option A or B will be an additional quote going out as a new scope for part B of our pool. Yes, yeah, so just a phase two. Thing. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. and just to clarify <laughs> to Amber's point, I don't want to make false promises to people. This wouldn't be going out like immediately to go with this. There'd be all the steps that go into this, and then we'd have to plan out 
how you'd finance it and what the timeline would look for that. And that would be for facilities and otherwise. I just don't want people thinking that they right. would it has do to, this in we, we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. So and it's, everyone should and, put the and, shovels and, down. And <laughs> in relationship to what's already on our project list and stuff and whether or not that can be massaged or whether or not something that's on there gets pushed back or phase two of this gets pushed towards the end of the construction such whatever it is you know that all has to be part of the mix because we do have a very 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 good capital projects fund but it's not infinite right right i said the same thing many times <laughs> <laughs> okay so we are we are not canceling the contract so we do not have to vote on this yeah we don't need to vote and no motion was made. Too. I, I, I would suggest a motion and then let it fail if that's what you want to do. Yes, that's what we need to do. Got it. Okay, so. <laughs> Just read the motion, yeah. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to call the motion for a vote, and there needs to be a second to call the motion for a vote. That doesn't mean support or denial. So, um, and everyone will then be able to vote, and uh, should hypothetically it not pass then it doesn't pass I, I think this is safer having this published already as an official agenda item that it, it dies in in, in our right. hands or okay yeah Ken, I'd like to make a motion. We move forward and call the question on the next step for the Niles West Swimming Pool discussion and action. Second. No, no. Me to it. Good job. Okay. Have a roll call. Member Stennett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. Be voting yes. yes Thank you for to clarifying. To cancel Tom. the contract. Oh, if okay. you wanted to cancel the contract, you'd vote yes. Voting no says move forward with the renovation. We're not canceling yes. the contract. It's just no. phase two. That's all it is. Member Abraham? No. Uh, Member Jacobs? No. Member Nowick? No. Member Wood? No. Member Dr. Coe? Member Durr? No. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So. We'll, we'll see the pool people at our facilities meeting when it's time to. <laughs> <laughs> you better have some yeah. extra seats, so, Joe. So, point, point, uh, point of personal privilege, Ken. So, before the pool people leave, um, as some of you may or may not have re recalled, uh, or it may or may not have been discussed, um, at our facilities committee meeting, one of the suggestions that was made was that the meeting of the facilities committee be made and moved to a time that is more conducive to public input and public's comments. So that is under discussion. So please be on the lookout for uh, when that updated meeting time is going to be. Um, our chair will be sorting that out with the administrative staff. So. Um, uh, but I, I won't put any to be tuned. I won't put any unnecessary pressure on our accountant. I mean, our architect to have everything ready in the two weeks when our next meeting is scheduled. So be mindful that when it's ready, we'll <laughs> <laughs> right, it's a week away. So chances are the next next facilities meeting will not um, discuss the pool concept because we don't have the full concept yet. But at that point, at some point, we will have a more thorough vetted uh, presentation that we will then have on the agenda and, and ask for input. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Next, we have the weekly late start discussion. Ms. Connolly, Ms. Gonzalez, and Dr. Haskins will present. No, I thought this would be the, uh, the event of the evening, I guess not. Um, so tonight we are presenting on um, our weekly late starts. Um, Bridget will kick us off with some um, information about the memo and the history and evolution of how we got here. Sure. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for those that have remained and that are still <laughs> stayed tuned in after the lively pool discussion. Um, we are here to provide um, an update on our late start, um, in particular our SLO process. You heard 
um, from the PAR presentation a little bit about teacher evaluation, the impact of the time, um, the ability to look at um, data and assessment and process what's been happening. Um, as promised, um, when the board approved the time in uh, March of last school year, the 90 minutes every week has been solely devoted to the SLO process, which um, really looks at student growth over a specific period of time. And that student growth is a required component in the teacher evaluation process. So you heard the PAR uh, folks talking a lot about the teacher eval process and that student growth is a, a required component for all educators in the field. Um, so in September's opening of schools report, or what um, Amber dubbed are what we did over the summer, um, we shared a little bit about SLOs and PLCs, as well as the role of our directors and educator peer leaders who would have, um, that they would have in the professional learning plan for the year. And as Bridget mentioned, it was solely focused on the SLO process. So to support our staff in the transition to the SLO process, um, each professional learning plan's month of focus was on an element of that process. So in an effort to give you all an abbreviated experience of what going through this process entails, um, we'll use it as the structure of our presentation tonight. So I'll kick us off with uh, element one, learning goal as part of the series. And the learning goal is essentially a description of what students will be able to do at the end of a specified period of time. And so the question that we ask, the crucial question that we ask is, what do we want our students to learn? And so in thinking about our staff as learners, we're asking them and we're looking at, what do we want our staff to learn by the end of the year? So the what, why, and how that's baked into this process, it's the uh, SLO, simply put, the SLO process under the what. Um, in which it is representative of the most essential learning and student growth targets that um, and within a specific content area, grade, or class. And embedded within that process is the development of assessments that are used as tools to measure student growth. The why, it's pretty clear. We have made a commitment to empower our students and a promise to clear paths in ways that promote student growth, success through agency and positive self-identity. And that goes hand in hand with the how, the learning by doing and allowing educators, giving them the opportunity to collaborate and engage and coalesce and engage in recurring cycles of um, collective inquiry, action research that really informs uh, what they need to do in next steps and going forward with promoting student achievement. And so you may remember last month, um, Christine gave a pretty robust presentation on uh, the academic report. And within that, there was information about the Illinois State Board of Education report card. And so the report card highlights uh, academic indicators for student success, as well as non-academic measures for schools and for the district. And this essentially helps us to, it guides our work, but it also bridges that connection between the SLO and what the state measures um, for our outcomes for our students. So the second element of the SLO process is assessment. Um, and this element is defined as the assessment, evaluation, and scoring procedures used to support and measure the learning goal, or element one. Um, so our essential question here is, how will we know when each student has learned it? And again, in thinking of our staff as the learners, in what ways are we monitoring the progress towards the learning goal we have set for them? So how are we determining if they are in fact learning and implementing this SLO process? So um, before we dive into the bulk of our presentation, which is the updates on the happenings during our weekly late starts, um, we wanted to share with you a model of data um, that Shane Safir and Jamelia Dugan use in their book, Street Data. And as we go through the next three elements of the SLO process and refer to the data that we've collected, we'll note the level of data using this model. 
So the word cloud pulls keywords from what I've seen and heard while sitting in a number of PLCs since the beginning of the school year. Um, it's street level data as we're classifying it, uh, which is qualitative, experiential, and most importantly, it's asset based. So some of the most exciting things that I've seen when I've had the opportunity to sit in these PLCs is what you've heard already from several people who presented tonight is that collaboration amongst colleagues. We're also seeing emerging leaders as we have leaders of these individual PLCs. We're seeing educator peer leaders step up, step up and providing professional development in um, co-facilitation with the directors of the department. So it's very exciting to see people um, take ownership and lead, these, lead this work and for our colleagues to be learning from each other. There's also been a intentional focus on the instructional strategies and alignment of our curricula. So through um, this SLO process and in our weekly late starts and PLCs, teachers are sharing strategies about how to best meet the needs of our students. And that's what we want for our teachers to talk about. How can we best meet the needs of our students? We're seeing calibration. So there's an alignment of expectations for what it means to know something or demonstrate proficiency. Um, we're seeing clear expectations communicated to each other, our colleagues and teachers, but also for our students. Um, one of the great things that, well, not great because of what I heard, but great because of the outcome, um, one of the teachers in one of the PLCs that I was um, sitting into, um, he was sharing how when he was in high school, he got a B on a paper. And when he asked his teacher, like, why did he get a B or what can I do to do better? The teacher said it felt like a B paper. And that's never something I would want for our kids to experience or for our teachers to communicate to our students. So our students absolutely deserved better. And with clear expectations for our students, we are, as Dr. Haskins said earlier, we're promoting that student personal growth, that success through agency and that positive self-identity. So a little bit about the street data that we've seen. As um, Christine has pointed, she's uh, been through probably every PLC um, on the academic side. And Rosina and I have concentrated our efforts on the student services side uh, of the equation. And there's been a lot of, as we discussed, a lot of common uh, themes that, we've, uh, that have been emerging that, that folks are sharing. Um, across both sides, academic and student success. And we wanted to share some of the testimonials that um, we uh, ask our teams to reflect on the time that they've had to collaborate um, and hit a lot of the, the lovely adjectives that Christine just described um, and provide feedback uh, uh, to us as to what's been uh, working with the SLO process. So I'll just read uh, some of the quotes and uh, Rosina will also read too since she likes reading quotes. Um, it has been very beneficial and crucial to have the time built into the day to be able to plan, prepare, collaborate, and consult with my colleagues regarding our students, what we can do to improve student experience and develop strategies to help create a sense of belonging for our students. Um, and as you remember earlier um, this school year, um, we teamed with the principals and talking about our common goal across the district is to improve or increase our student sense of belonging so it's nice to see that we're all working towards a common thread and i don't just love i don't just love reading quotes it's the <laughs> hearing the narratives and the experiences um, in this qualitative way the experience is a positive the opportunity to delve into information and use resources that i haven't always had access to has been mind opening i think you paraphrase that because I think the person said mind-blowing however the best part of my experience is in the, is the collaboration with my colleagues that speaks volumes um, and then the last one PLC uh, SEL work that social emotional learning work has provided our team with a chance to collaborate and be very intentional with our time in addition we have have the opportunity to cross collaborate and I'll, I'll just pause, meaning athletics, activities, the deans, student services, assistant principals and directors um, have all come together, not only working in their own individual PLCs, but have come together to share how, how we're working together to support and increase uh, sense of belongingness. Due to schedule constraints, we rarely have the opportunity to meet with various admin, admin and learn from each other, which is very important. 
So one of the pieces I want to highlight, which again goes to show how important this work is, but also how dedicated our staff members are, um, the SLO process and the student growth component is only required legally um, via para law um, for our academic and instructional staff. So these are staff members who, not, who do not have a student growth component, but are engaging in the work because they believe in setting goals for our students, collecting data, and engaging in these cycles of inquiry to best meet the needs of our students, even though these aren't the academic needs of our students. We know that they all work hand in hand. We see it in the ISB, ISB report card. Um, so I think it's a testament to their commitment um, and their dedication that it's not part of their evaluation. Um, the third element of the SLO process are growth targets, um, and ISB defines these as ambitious yet re realistic targets for all students. So once these are set, we think about how will we respond when a student is experiencing difficulty, and how will we enrich the learning for students who have met these targets. And a term that you've heard earlier today, and that is in every educator's vocabulary, is differentiation. So differentiation is tailoring instruction to meet the needs of, your, of, of our students. So you've heard us mention that a few times. Um, and when I'm in the PLCs, and I do want to clarify, I have not been in every single PS, PLC. I, I try to go as many as I can, but um, I think we're in week 10 of PLCs. So I've maybe visited 10 to 15, because sometimes they take the entire time while I'm there, as opposed to me bouncing around. Um, but when I'm in there, I get most excited when I hear the discussions about what we can do to meet the needs of our students. That's really what our teachers are focusing on. Um, in Zaretta Hammond's Culturally Responsive Teaching, uh, she re refers to Lev Vygotsky's um, work in describing what we call the productive struggle. So I'll give you a moment to kind of look at this, um, this image here. So instruction is most beneficial when the task is just beyond the student's capabilities. So ambitious yet realistic for our students. And by engaging in what we're calling the productive struggle, students can experience maximum cognitive growth and become independent learners. So every day, our educators help our students in navigating this learning pit. In my opinion, it's the most challenging and exciting, par exciting part about being a teacher. Um, it's what separates professional educators from random people on the street. Uh, teachers are able to provide just the right level of support for the students while still allowing for them to engage in that productive struggle. We never want to take away the challenge. We don't want to make it easy. We want to make it meaningful for them and their learning. And element four, outcome is the element four of the progression in our educators, they experience uh, productive struggle as well. But the outcome, it's how students perform at the end of the instructional period. Um, how the number of uh, or percentage of students who met their identified growth targets translate into an appropriate teacher rating as you kind of heard about this earlier this evening in the evaluation. So for purposes of measuring the effectiveness of professional learning happening during the weekly late starts, we're gonna look at these other levels of data, which Christine highlighted. The satellite data, which examines, it really illuminates the uh, process of examining like the three levels of data, right? Um, the achievement and the performance. And then the math data helps us to identify competency and skill gaps. And then finally, the, while both of those data sources they point us into a focused direction. It's the street data that provides the qualitative data that helps us to better understand the experiences, the narratives, as well as the mindset misconceptions, um, because it really requires us to engage in focused listening. And so here, I love this slide. So this slide illustrates a proven theory of action based on research. Um, the impact of, it really shows the impact of PLCs on student achievement. And so we see here, this is actually a 2014 study that's being referenced um, by scholars in the field in 2015. But it um, shows that when implemented, PLCs when implemented with fidelity and deeply and well over a period of time, the impact is significant. So sustaining that as you see that trajectory, it's going up in a positive direction, 
in uh, literacy, numeracy, and science, but also we see that in SEL factors, non-academic measures as well. And if we haven't highlighted enough the value um, in learning by doing and learning from each other, um, this study was shared with me by Megan McGovern and Britt Traperna, who are science teachers at Niles West. Um, Britt is one of our educator peer leaders, and they included this in their professional learning that she co-leads with her science department. So this is very much a process in which all of our educators, all of our colleagues are engaging in the work and sharing the work with each other, myself included. Um, so type three assessment. So one of the other what's um, that was mentioned when we were talking about the learning goal um, was developing assessments that would be used for measurement. So what will come of this work, uh, which we're gonna identify in this case as level two map data, um, are type two assessments, which is the fancy pair language for common assessments. So common assessments are um, administered to an entire grade, course, or subject area. So the benefits that we can expect, and again, these are in development this year, but these are the benefits we hope to see through the fruition of this work. So we expect to see calibration and alignment, so consistent expectations in each of our classes, regardless of the period, teacher, or school, and the interpretation and implementation of national standards that are consistent in each course. We, we also expect to see, through common assessments, um, in the realm of instructional practice, um, it creates opportunities for teachers to have a base of a basis of comparison with each other. Um, they can more easily co-plan um, when everyone is teaching the same thing at about the same time. Um, all things equal, an individual teacher can get an idea of whether or not the strategy they're employing is effective in helping their students acquiring the intended learning outcome. And if not, they have colleagues readily available with whom they can seek input. Um, we hope to also see the evaluation of our own curricula. So with these common assessments, uh, we're provided with timely evidence of whether, whether our curricular programs are working. Um, it allows us to identify areas in which we're hitting the mark, as well as areas in which we need to make adjustments. And finally, we hope to see, um, we're actually seeing a lot of this already, but it's in line with what we spoke about earlier in that common assessments allow us to identify opportunities for enrichment and challenge for our students who need more, but also allows us to provide the additional support and targeted support to the students who need it. And the last element is uh, the teacher rating. And as uh, Christine already mentioned, the, the para committee, which we um, now named the district evaluation committee, um, comprised of administrators, uh, us three, um, and some union members. We are using the SLO for our student growth rating, um, but we are still in the process of determining what exactly that will look like. Um, as Christine mentioned, we're in the process of de developing the assessment. So for year one, uh, given that this is our first year of implementation, um, the expectation is that at a minimum, teachers would be uh, rated as proficient as long as they're um, participating in the SLO process with integrity and authenticity, which is exactly what we're seeing um, even for those that, as Christine said, don't have the student growth as a requirement in their evaluation tool. Um, and currently, the, the DEC is working on for the SY24-25 school year, one type two and one type three assessment that will be used to measure student growth going forward. So um, the DEC is actively uh, meeting um, and, and having discussions about what that would look like and gathering feed, feedback and input so that we can um, have, a, have a greater understanding of what student growth will look like for the following school year um, by February of 2024. So we've talked, we've, we've mentioned a whole lot of um, acronyms today. Mm -hmm. uh, so kind of connecting how the SLO process connects with our um, PLCs, which we've been talking about. Um, so you might have heard us mentioning specific questions um, as we were introducing or speaking to each of the elements of the SLO process. And so those are the four, cru four crucial questions um, that drive the continuous improvement cycles of the PLCs. So when speaking about element one, the learning goal, our focus was what do we want for each student to learn? 
When speaking of element two, our assessment, how will we know when each student has learned it? And when speaking to element three, uh, we talked about how will we respond when a student experiences difficulty and how will we accelerate and extend the learning for students who are proficient. So all of these things, if you think of the SLO process as a year long um, means to support students in meeting their learning and growth targets, the PLCs are that continuous micro cycle um, along the way to ensure that this happens. So through this SLO learn, so, so though our SLO learning is coming to an end, uh, my hope is that we can continue with the PLCs, these collaborative, collaborative these are tough words, collaborative <laughs> recurring cycles of collective inquiry and action research, um, not only so that we can see the academic gains, but so that we can continue to put our students first and their learning first. How do I follow that? I know that was slide. a, I know, a lot of fitting. alliteration there. <laughs> yeah, so among the evaluation of student growth and teacher practice, it is prudent that we ensure that we are continuously evaluating the performance of our PLCs. Just like you asked earlier, are you evaluating? How are you like measuring the impact of like the PAR program? Similarly, we are evaluating our PLCs. The US Department of Education offers us a great guide um, to help us to collect um, multiple data sources and look at those key indicators. We, rec we, are, um, we know that we have to be not just accountable to our students and the State Board of Education, but also to our stakeholder groups. So this is a guide that helps us to um, you know, go back and look at our checks and balances, how are we doing, and asking the same four questions of the program that we're asking of the students and our educators. Okay. So that concludes our presentation. I guess what questions do we have? I know, you're shocked. Um, first thing, the my favorite quote on the entire thing is, we must go into the pit calm and ready. Um, that was from the the the, uh, the the productive struggle. I thought that was really interesting thinking about how we are calmly guiding kids through this challenge and through this struggle. And um, so I think that was this is so. Thank you. This presentation was fantastic. Um, I think you waste your brilliance on us. I would love to see some of this articulated to the parents and community at large. Um, to help them understand how this time is being used in such an incredible, valuable way. Um, you know, my son said to me tonight before I, he le before I left for the meeting, oh, don't worry, mom, I get to sleep in. I, get, I have late start tomorrow. And I was like, yes, but there's a lot of work happening while you're sleeping. So I think it would be really helpful to parents in the community at large to hear about this productive growth. Um, so something to, to think about in terms of communication. That could be fun to do, to walk through, the, like do installments and walk through each segment of the progression, each element. But you talked a little bit about like the qualitative data, the street data with our students. Do you want to say more about that? I don't remember. <laughs> At 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, we're, we're, I'm sure it was brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's early. So it's late in the thunder. night, but early in the school year in that, um, you know, where oh. it, it takes um, at least 10 weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm quoting that number correctly, but 10 weeks for routine to set in when it in terms of implementing PLCs. So in terms of the, the evidence of academic gains that we're hoping to see, it's very early. Um, but, but what we know is that students are seeing changes in their classroom, and those are some of the testimonials that we hope to share at a later presentation because we also at some point need to ask for these weekly late starts again so that we can continue this work. So while I appreciate your cautious scientific approach to it, I think that some general community communication would be really helpful in terms of kind of um, informing parents, informing the community as to kind of why this, um, the productive pieces of why this was generated. So I, um, I applaud you all in this um, not easy work and um, you have my appreciation. Well, Rosina already said that sounded fun, Amber. Those were her exact like words. So she can one. be in charge of all that. <laughs> I heard it. 
thank you for the presentation. Um, on the one slide that you saw, it showed an average gain of the PLC implementation. Um, I noticed that on that slide, it seemed the gain started to take hold about three years into the program. Mm -hmm. So uh, can I assume that you're going to have a baseline for the, the future board of where we are now and then every three years? Well, we started last year, so two years from now, we'll actually have the first increment and see how we're mm -hmm. moving up those, uh, those scales. Absolutely. I think we have every intention. Um, right now, we share very much the, the street data, that level three that we've seen and heard, our observations. Um, but through this work, we will be able to collect data from our common assessments. We will be able to use our satellite data, like our SAT suite and other measures that we administer, um, to um, hopefully show these gains uh, with the, the number of years of implementation. Yeah, looking forward to that. Instead of data from someone else right um, likewise, likewise on the non-academic side although it's all interconnected if you're not ready and available to learn then you're not going to be able to process whatever math or English targets are we will have updated panorama they're just closing the survey so we'll have updated um, SEL data from panorama we'll have um, we'll start to see, are we making any gains on um, freshmen on track? Are we making any gains with respect to um, attendance initiatives and chronic truancy? So it's going to take some time, but we will start to really dive into what that trend data is telling us. I think the community and the parents are going to love when that, that trend is going the right way for, for them all. Um, so when you're in Florida and you can't go out into the beach and you're doing a lot of work, you have a lot of free time. So I was like writing down some metrics that I thought would be appropriate if I was doing this. And one of the metrics that I came up with was um, teacher participation and engagement. And I'm wondering, do we track the teachers, how, how actively they're involved in the, the late start sessions, the PLC se sessions? and. Uh, uh, are they all showing up or uh, are they all prepared? You know, I, I was just wondering, is that correct at all? Um, well, one, one piece of evidence is I've not told any of the groups in advance when I am showing up and they've all been there and working. Okay. Um, the second piece is that there's a, there's a huge layer of um, deprivatization and transparency in this PLC process. So all of their agendas are shared with each other. Um, and also with their directors. So the directors, um, we are holding them accountable to ensuring that the work is happening during these late start times. Okay, thank you. There's a sign in and sign yes. out as oh, well. I even, sign in and sign I even wrote thank sign you. in sheet. Yep. And <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're so engaged, they forget to sign out. We have to remind them right, about okay. signing out. Okay, fair enough. Um, and then you, you talked about implementation of SLO, so thank you. I think you're covering that metric. And as, as we see more and more teachers applying what they learned, I think that's going to be a very positive thing. Student growth data. I, I like the way I came up with these metrics. Mm -hmm. They're similar to here. So thank you. I think that's going to be very vital. Uh, feedback from the educators. Have you created a feedback loop from the teachers who are participating in, in these in these um, Wednesday uh, meetings to see if, if they're getting what they think or if they make suggestions on improvement? Those testimonials uh -huh. were just um, a couple of examples, a few examples, but we will continue to offer a multitude of ways for them to provide feedback. Okay, thank you. That's great. And student parent peak feedback, I guess you're going to have that loop in there too because they'll be able to speak. The, at least the students, as you said, mm -hmm. classrooms getting different and better and more. Uh, one of the things we were um, kicking around is, uh, is really um, interviewing some students Yes, late start gives students the much needed respite, right? All the research shows that that um, student, students this age need that time. But it will also be interesting to see um, what the impact is on the classroom um, for, for the students. So we've been kicking around some ideas about how to um, get that in various arenas um, on the student success side as well um, uh, as far as, you know, deans have been talking at our last PLC about how they um, they were looking at the data um, and really tracking students and figuring out, you know, uh, tardies, for example, and chime in if I'm misremembering this because my brain's not firing on all cylinders right now. But um, the deans were talking about, oh, we found a, 
a snag in our system that we had to correct. These students really didn't have a tardy, but it gave us an opportunity to connect and build relationships with students that we normally, that would not be on our radar because they're not getting into trouble, they're not missing classes, they're, they're um, you know, seemingly functioning well, but it's building a different relationship, which has, a very positive impact on belongingness um, for students in, in our schools and our community. So I think that's also interesting to see the impact of really diving in on an individual level for some of our administrators too. So those are some of the things that we, we've been seeing just anecdotally. And the last metric I had jotted down for myself, and this is like a subjective me, but I don't think I'm the only one. When, you, when, when I start off with a, a a fixed timeline with a group and you have certain objectives established there's a high energy at the beginning of it and then as it, as it progresses along there's a little bit of deterioration and usually it takes a good uh, facilitator or someone running that group to recharge and get it back up to uh, uh, you know no notice that dip and then bring it back up we have people who are running these sessions that are aware of that or are trying to to keep the conversation energized and moving forward at the same clip as when it starts. When it starts brand new and fresh, everyone jumps on board, and then as it drags on, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth session, I, this is just me speaking. If I see a drop, I don't know if anyone else has witnessed that in their career. So I'm just wondering if that is something that you'll be aware of and maybe take some precautions to try to. Sure. So, so a couple things. Like one, um, earlier I mentioned how we're seeing so many emerging leaders. So each of the PLCs has a facilitator and um, some of them may choose within their structure to rotate that role. So that in itself keeps it fresh, right? Um, the other piece about PLCs is that um, the work in itself is active work that is happening in the classroom. So they're always planning, doing, studying, and acting on something new. So they're planning and working on the upcoming lesson, the upcoming assessment. So it doesn't get stale, if you will, because it's always something they're going to be actively planning for in the upcoming weeks. Thank you. I had uh, one more question. It's kind of the, the flip of uh, member Noix. So if the if the um, if the baseline or the floor is the first two to three years, uh, is there a ceiling after ten years, or we we don't have that data yet? Uh, this study doesn't, but it doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um, I mean, last month we had shared data from well back into I think 2011-12. So we, we continue to collect and maintain it and mon collect and monitor collect and maintain the data and monitor our own progress. Um, again, we're not looking at the achievements of our student, but how are we doing as a district to support all students in their learning? So whether or not we have beyond ten, ten years in this, I know that we'll have the data internally to track our own progress. Is the expectation for it to continue to it ascend? Can't that, it can't at that level. It, it would cur it would flatten it out. To okay. At some Okay. They just haven't had it yet in their yeah. data. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been a decade, right? That's 10 years. Yeah, that's a 10 year. Yeah. That's a 10 year plot. But they also, if you notice, it's not universal in terms of the numbers on the axis. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. also adjusts what the scale looks like. So. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, Thank you very much for your presentation. All right, next we have the SAT prep stipends discussion. So I accidentally closed my notes. Um, so the memo that you have in front of you is for the um, approval for our SAT um, practice program uh, for this current school year. So this is not a new program. It's a program that's been um, in place since we have switched to the SAT um, following the change in our um, accountability measures for the state. Um, and here are my notes. And so um, as I mentioned last month, our juniors are required to take the SAT as part of Illinois spring assessment requirements. Um, and one of the, it's yes, it's an accountability measure, but it's also a great free opportunity for our students to have a reportable test score that they can send to any of the prospective universities that they um, have shown interest in. 
And so by offering this program, our hope is to provide students with additional support. So no, this is not just a prep for the test program. It's a how can we support our students in building the skills that they need to be college and career ready. So whether or not they're prepping for a test, we hope that they will gain um, the knowledge and skill set to be successful beyond it. What's the, Christine, thank you. I think this is fantastic. Um, I think that, um, I'll ask my question. Um, what is the capacity for the three sessions? Uh, like how many kids are we able to serve um, in, in these three, uh, it's three, th eight three hour sessions, 24 hours total. Mm -hmm. So there's three session, three sections. Oh, I, I'm trying to think of where I put this in my notes. Um, the numbers that we've had, I believe there's a total of 60 at each of the buildings, um, and we've never had to turn anyone away. So this, this captures all the students who have wanted to traditionally take the prep course in the past. Um, let me get the actual numbers for you. Mm -hmm. On the same uh, topic, I was just curious, what percentage of students take the preparation versus that are required to take the test? Would you know that? Rachel? Yeah, so it's a smaller number because the prep program that we're employing utilizes a free Khan Academy prep that's available to all students. So our hope is that all students access the free resources that are available. Um, but should students need additional guidance or support with certified staff members, this is a great opportunity for them to do so. How are students put into the, uh, rec are you recommended for the program? Can you just volunteer for the program? Volunteer, so any student who wants to sign up, um, pending approval, we hope to send the email out by the end of the week so the students can commit to it and begin the SAT prep program shortly after the break. And do you have to be a junior to sign up? Yes. Okay. I think Jill had a question. Um, I guess when you have a lot of time, you ask a lot of questions. Um, so the Khan, uh, Khan Academy states that 20% of SAT prep produces an average score gain of 115 points. The coffee I take in the morning says I'm gonna be 10% happier than the competition brands. Do we have something that verifies that? Or, or do we measure students who take the prep versus students who do not take the prep and see how their averages are on the SAT here at? At D219? Yeah, that's a national number. So that, that's been vetted. So they did this study with for 20, for every 20 hours of Khan Academy practice that you did, and they have the records for everyone, the average score gain was 115 points above those students that did not do 20 hours of um, Khan Academy work. Interestingly, that score growth is greater in... Um, in typically lower performing groups over time. So it's, it's actually remarkable how effective Khan Academy has been proven to be. We don't have the numbers for here because we've never tracked Khan Academy by person registered to the district. So can I follow up then? So that data from the Khan Academy, Academy is, is pretty national and everything. Is that just taking their online course without any tutors or support? Yes. So with our tutors and support, we should get a higher number. <laughs> <laughs> here's, the, here's the simple truth. And I've said this to people before about, um, I, I told you last time how much I hate the term SAT prep because I really think it's about improving your learning so that you'll do better on a good assessment, but you'll do better on every assessment. One of the biggest issues for parents is in how do I get my kid to do it because Khan Academy is so uniquely alone doing it. And so people will pay huge amounts, amounts that boggle my mind. That's my next racket um, to get these results. So part of this is just commit to this time with us. You'll have a teacher in the room. You'll have a professional there that can work with you. I hope it would be better than that number, but even if it were just that number, that's such a great number, we're good with it. But it's really a service for, you know, it's kind of the parents not constantly checking in at junior year where there's a whole lot of things to fight with your child about, about are you doing your Khan Academy right now? I think you're reading my questions, because my next question was, um, do we track the students, like say they, 
they, they jump in and they want to take the the 20 hours worth of con training do we do we or do the people that we're in other words, do, the, do we know if the kids only took 10 hours and then stopped, or, or are we tracking their, their progress yeah, their, through those their 20 hours? engagement and participation. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's the layer of it's a free program, so um, it's, it's basically if kids want to do it and they're motivated, they will continue to do so. Um, from our perspective, we are offering it regardless if a student shows up or doesn't show up for what they signed for. So as we said, it's the Khan Academy program and preparation that the students are doing with the teachers. But in each of the sections, we have both a math and um, English instructor so that they are supporting the students with the targeted strategies that Khan Academy highlights. Joe, for your to go around, I mean, this is something I would say to everybody on the board if you're in education. And um, what Sal Khan's done is remarkable. Um, in this program, as you mentioned, being bored in Florida, go on Khan Academy and pick a subject and go through it for yourself. <clears throat> Remarkable. When I'm, I, I find myself going to Khan Academy relatively frequently to freshen up on something. I'm like, wait a minute, what was that again? Um, and it's in subjects beyond just, that's the thing, it's not just for prep. It's a far greater educational tool that all of our kids should be accessing at different points. So in terms of um, accessibility, the juniors, um, how do they fit this into their schedule? Is it like established schedule already or is it something that they could fit into their own individual schedule? So in the past, there's, there's three different sessions from which they can choose from, each um, offered in the afternoon at this time. Um, but in speaking with Marlon and Steve, our assistant principals of operation who oversee the programs at each of the building, um, they have shared with me that they have ideas for which we can improve the program that we provide our students in addition to um, such as, sorry, such as providing additional times during which the students can take it. So right now we're operating as it has because that's what we've prepared for, um, but we have every intent following this to collect data, collect feedback, so that we can see how we can better meet the needs of our students who are interested in participating in this program. Yeah, yeah, thank you, because I'm just concerned about those students who have the full load and yeah, it's hard to fit. Everything is new for me this year, so yeah. we are we are working yeah. with what we have, but we plan to not just improve this program, but also, you know, t um, Superintendent Moore and I have talked about there are lots of things that we can do better in each of our classrooms mm -hmm. um, in terms of how we incorporate intentionally these SAT and college and career readiness skills. And so um, there are a lot of things that we can include. Again, not teaching to the test, but how can reinforce, how can we reinforce some of the skills mm -hmm. that we want for students to be able to do in our normal classrooms? Yeah. It's a great program, by the way. My daughter did it and mm -hmm. helped out a lot. These are, and these are the discussions Christine and I have had, in all honesty, up until last week about do we bring this forward in this, we both support this, don't, don't misinterpret this, we support this program. I do think there's ways we can continue to look at this and make it better and make it more accessible and make it bigger and make it part of the school day, make it part of homeroom. There's a lot of things we can do here to utilize tools. This is something, you know, when we look at, when we look at snow days, which are now e-learning days, okay, how does Khan Academy fit into that day in what a teacher would use? So, yeah. Last question, sorry. So um, I was trying to figure it out, but can you give me like an approximation of what the total cost is? I mean, you broke it down by hour based on BA, MA, and so on, but do we know like how many teachers will be involved in the 25-hour in the tr training? Six per sec, so six total per building, 12. I'll, I'll have to get back to you oh, okay. on that exact. No, no, um, I, yeah, approximate, close enough. Yeah. Six, six teachers will be doing So the there's 25. three sessions uh -huh. at each building, each with two teachers. Okay. And so, yeah, so 12 times, 12 times whatever 25. our highest is, times 54, okay. 55. Okay, thank you. So moved. Program paying teachers the <laughs> hourly rate for 25 hours of instruction specific here. 
All right, we'll do that over again. <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Second. All right, can I have a roll call? Uh, Member Abraham? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Nowick? Yes. Uh, Member Dr. Coe? Member Stennett? Yes. Member Durr? Yes. Thank you, Christy. <clears throat> This is software and support renewals. Although she is excited about that, not that excited. <laughs> All right. As you may see, we have no slides to show you. The information you have before you. Uh, for Colin, uh, uh, Colin uh, he's got more information than. I have. I mean, I, I know the whole scope of it, but I think he can give you some of the specific details. Yep. Uh, so as you know, our, inter, our original intergovernmental agreement that is part of our CFC with our center schools included a unified student information system, uh, which we use as Infinite Campus. This past summer, uh, in June, we renewed not only our software license for Infinite Campus, but also the cost for the separation of this. Both District 219 and our center school districts are in agreement that there are numerous benefits to separating these systems um, where each district can kind of operate underneath their own parameters and their own needs that they have. Um, so in the course of that, this is our trial year of that, our transition year as they go through that. So each district has their own sandbox within Infinite Campus that they can use to um, test their system to make sure it works properly. The original quote that was presented in June uh, did not include some of the premium products that come along with Infinite Campus. These are all products that the districts currently have access to right now, um, and they need access to be able to use those and implement them right now in the sandbox stage to ensure that they have a smooth transition process throughout the year. Um, we have looked into the cost of, of when that, when that um, in integration with those premium products taking place? Does it make a difference whether they have access to them right now versus they have access to them in April and there's no difference in the cost of those uh, changes? Um, so it makes sense for us to add on this additional cost. It was not in the original proposal. Um, that additional cost would cover their access to the premium services. This includes things like their messenger system that provides voicemail and SMS uh, services as they communicate with their parents. Um, so that's I think all the detail, technical details. Phil, did I miss anything? Um, the only thing I, I would add is one of those premium tools is, is uh, Tableau, which is a data visualization tool um, that will help them to uh, take their data and explain it to their boards and their communities uh, a little more thorough. I like to think of this as a, uh, think of conjoined twins or conjoined triplets in this case. We have to finally make the separation and then there's a cost to make that separation so that there's three separate entities. And so in this case, um, uh, we're going to help them and hold their hand through that process and uh, ensure their success. So, any questions? Um, oh, Joe, yeah, okay. Um, so, Phil and Colin, hi. Um, can you all do me a favor and help me understand the financials behind this? Because um, I want to make sure that I know what we're voting on here. So we renewed already with Infinite Campus for a total of $173,446.28. Now it says net cost to D219 after CFC share cost is $220,014.28. So are we voting to spend an additional $220,000? No, we are spending the difference between the 46. two. 46. 46. So it's just the, so we are voting to spend just the 46 right now. That's correct. That's a very additional different conversation. That okay. we didn't have for the previous services okay so the only thing that we are voting on tonight is the forty six thousand five hundred sixty eight dollars mm -hmm. and that is due to the fact that with the new IGA that's presented in the information portion of the agenda that the some of the sender schools are opting to um, uh, divest themselves of infinite campus so they, they, they will still have infinite campus on um, those to be working with the same system they'll still be able to share their information with us um, but this lets them customize things without running through it the entire approval of the entire CFC collaboration. Fascinating. All right, cool, thanks. Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. A la carte. And then, yeah. can I? 
I just have one question. So there's a difference of like roughly 75,000. So that is what the other districts will be um, dividing amongst the three districts. Is that how it Correct. works? That's, that's organized okay. by each district's cost share agreement. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to look at the future in terms of the entire Niles Township and all our nine sender schools. Right now, what we're doing here is we're allowing our two CFC partners to like kind of become independent a little bit. Mm -hmm. And this will allow them to have a little bit more latitude with that software, but we still be able to communicate. Yep. Is that my understanding? That's correct. So, of the seven schools that are not part of CFC, does Infinite Campus allow us to have the ability to review their data? I mean, is, it, is there some way they could dump it into some? They do, they do export it to us okay. um, in various formats, um, and we can collect it. And we useful. can choose to put it in, into our Infinite Campus, or we can choose to put it in Tableau, which is our data visualization tool to get the big picture of, of all nine center districts. So the most common example is our PSAT 8 data okay. um, that our districts send to us to use for placement in their freshman year. Okay, so you're able to extract that information and it's useful information Correct. for the entire township. Those other seven Correct. districts have already um, chosen to have their own SIS um, all completely on their own as well. Okay. So. But to your question, I think if it, whether it's infinite campus or not, we can still share yes. data. Okay. It could Thank be power schools, that's, I think that's important that we yeah. Have, it, treat it, everybody. Equal. It would be more ideal if we were all using the same. It system. would be, and some and some have switched from Power School to Infinite Campus mm -hmm. as a result of this uh, to make it a, a smoother transition. Yeah. And as a reminder, one of the the goals of this was to have a, um, a cost benefit to it as we we purchase those licenses in bulk. Um, and so this is a cost savings it's to our center incentive. districts as part yeah. of that collaboration that we are still um, purchasing those licenses in bulk and then getting reimbursed as part of that cost sharing agreement. Yeah, so I just had a question about, you just said that some of the center schools have um, switched to Infinite Campus. So how many are not on Infinite Campus? That's a really good question. I'd have to look that up, okay. but I do know of one that uh, made made the changes to oh, Infinite okay. Campus. Yeah. Hopefully more will be yeah. jumping on that wagon. Possibly. Um, okay. you know, well, I mean, as somebody who came from a school where they where we were using Infinite Campus mm -hmm. to D219, my kid has the same email address. Mm -hmm. My I know how to work the system. I can add money to their lunch card. I can look at their grades, and it didn't require an additional programmatic understanding when you're already trying to learn a whole new school system and a whole new way of learning and everything else. So, um, What a great marketing. Yeah, I was going to say, big fan, big fan. I'm going to sign Amber up to uh, evangelize those. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they could use some Outliers. Help. Okay. okay. Member Noah? Yeah, one more question. Um, this may not directed to you. I just want to just be clear in my head. So um, CFC uh, intergovernmental agreement with 67 and 69 expires next June? Correct. Um, has this board voted to continue that? So we have as an information item later this that's evening? Yes, yeah, so that's information item come later up. tonight and will come up. Um, <coughs> in, in, <coughs> okay, mm -hmm. so we're voting to implement a pro, uh, additional cost program prior to voting on CFC continuing or not? Uh, timeline basically would have that be that way. You're really voting for the increase, but the right. truth is whether or not CFC continued, you'd still be wanting that yeah. interplay. The separation. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted, yeah, I, I no, thought I, I missed a, yeah. a meeting where yeah. this was decided already. <laughs> no, 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 no. The IGA, <laughs> we're still, we're basically finalized. Well, my so. tenants is pretty good. Yeah. So your tenants is pretty good. Too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, never mind, I'll say. No, all of our active members are here. All right. Um, if all minds are clear, may I have a motion for the Board of Education to approve the increased software renewal cost of $46,568 for Infinite Campus? So moved. Second. May I have a roll, please. Uh, Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Nowick? Yes. Member Dr. Coe? Member Stennett? Yes. 
Member Wood? Yes. Member Abraham? Yes. Member Wood? I'm sorry, Member Durr. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you, Phil and Kyle. Thank you. Okay, now we come to the fun part. <laughs> Policy, first reading. Ray, take us away. All right, is this on? All right, we have first reading for tonight. Um, <clears throat> mostly press changes we do have a few that are just coming um, from either <coughs> board or, act or administrative recommendations um, so we'll start at 2 220 um, that one has just non-substantive changes that's the uh, powers and duties of the school board indemnification policy <coughs> and for some reason this is not loading give me one second okay so you'll see uh, paragraph six, just a quick line that contracts need to be applicable with state and federal law. Otherwise, no other major changes. 280, board ethics. Um, this is coming, uh, th we'll read this and along with 2140, um, there has been a request from the committee to emphasize um, that the any con to avoid any conflict of interest or the appearance of impropriety including on social media so you'll see that uh, short phrase added to the board ethics uh, to 120 just removing um, you see the language in red um, but overall non-substantive changes to 140 so this will be read so you can read 280 e and 2140 together um, just just putting a, a disclaimer or putting a statement in our policy um, reminding all board members current and future board members that uh, if you do have a social media presence that you should um, place some sort of visible disclaimer on there that you don't speak for the entire board um, this is just to avoid confusion from public or any other audience that they're not reading uh, views or opinions of the, of the full board Okay. 2 200. Um, you will see an additional closed exemption item. Uh, school code was updated to allow the board to discuss in closed session whether or not, <clears throat> or evidence and or testimony of whether a individual should be denied admission to a school event or on school property. And so OMA now allows you to do that in closed session rather than in open. And then you will see uh, board member attendance at the bottom of page three of that policy. <clears throat> All that is is re reiterating that board attendance and participation is a part of uh, each of your fiduciary duties. Um, really, the, the, only, the only change is that before any um, bo before any review can take place by the board, that the board president will counsel the member, and then from there, um, if that does not work, then the board can go into uh, a review of um, a, a subject to board review. They can recommend censure. They can recommend um, or refer the uh, individual board member to the regional superintendent. Uh, for removal under board policy 260. So again, both neither are um, there. There one is a recommendation, and the other is a referral. The board doesn't have a the power to remove one one member. Okay. So again, written so that we can um, emphasize attendance for both current and future board members. Okay. So, Ray, I just wanted to, to pop in on this one. Yep. I just want to make sure that, you know, one of the reasons for this uh, proposal is because we talk about student attendance and chronic absenteeism. We talk about teachers being present in the classroom. It is only appropriate that we as board members who are making those kind of decisions and recommendations also demonstrate the same kind of dedication um, and, um, you know, showing up is half the battle. 
Right, and I think that um, you know, for the for the board of 2033 in the future, we want to make it very clear to them that showing up is your job, and if you've signed up for it, make sure you know what you're doing. So I just want to make sure that um, there's some a little bit of context in terms of where that's coming from. The next policy two two twenty. Um, in addition to, so this is regarding uh, video or audio uh, presence when you have a physical quorum. And um, school code allowed for three uh, reasons. They added one more, and so we're just adding that. It's for unexpected child care obligations. So just keyword unexpected. Ongoing child care would not work. It would be um, the board's responsibility to find child care, and should there be some sort of unexpected situation the board could request to attend a uh, meeting by video or audio assuming that there's already a physical quorum so ray to clarify this is a this is a um press um change and this is something that's actually already been mandated by law we have to just update our records to make sure that we're reflecting the Correct. policy it's correctly. a school code change um uh and so whatever happens to school code it'll make its way to us via press Two two thirty. Um, so, I don't know the legislative history here, but we used to have some language in here that, honestly, is just not feasible. Um, and so you'll see the language in red that used to require the board to um, send some or some form of position statement, um, but it, it's not it's not feasible. My recommendation is to go back to. Um, the press language is also mirroring um, OMA and school code. So, <clears throat> any questions there? 410. Um, this is going to be for beginning in the 24 25 school year, but there will be um, a, an annual requirement to include the annual average expenditures. Um, in talking with the business office, they're not concerned about this, something that they could have rolled out this year, but um, in compliance, we'll be in, we'll, we will follow and, and, and roll that out by next year. All right, 4.30, um, not a big change, um, but it's just adding another um, investment option for school boards with some criteria on what, what that looks like. For 60, um, all this language is saying that when a board wants to approve a purchase or a contract, it has to follow certain federal and state laws. And so it's adding uh, design build contracts that needs to follow school code, as well as um, district administered assessment contracts that need to follow school code. Four one six. And right, we're mm -hmm. also the the limit on number one is also being raised to thirty five thousand. Oh yeah, I missed that. Yes. Five one ninety. Changes to the bottom legal references. And five two hundred. Same thing. Updating legal references. Um, five two ten. This one's new. Um, it is the legislators attempt to address the teacher shortage uh, they are doing so by so right now if you resign to accept another teaching um, teaching opportunity um, it can't be without board consent what the legislator did is they also are now including within that any resignations um, 30 days prior to the first day of student attendance to count as a mid-year resignation um, so it still needs to go through board approval. Um, quite honestly, it happens. Um, and uh, there are teachers who find administrator positions. There are teachers who go closer to home. It happens. Um, it's not something I would personally bar. It puts us in a tough spot, but we honestly hire last minute and we're taking those teachers from another district as well. So um, it's kind of one of those things that I don't think it's going to help the teacher shortage. Um, but I think more so the important part is we, we don't want teachers leaving mid-year to accept another teaching position. 
but the first 30 days of school, it happens. So, but Ray, to, to the same point as, as we discussed before, because I, I also had mentioned in the policy committee, this feels like a lot of stick and not a lot of carrot. Um, and so, but you had mentioned to me that this is a change in school code, therefore it's something that we have to adopt. Correct. Um, and, uh, but with the understanding that, um, you know, we, we, we know how we operate here at D219. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, it's, it's, um, it's language that the board, <coughs> the board, uh, so the board can still consent. There's no, there's no barring consent or no barring resignation. It can happen, but it just has to go through the board. Okay. Uh, 5220 extends the uh, period for which uh, any retired teacher can um, work 120 days. Um, and then also in emergency situations, right now your a substitute teacher is limited to 30 days with approval from the ROE and proper notice and approval to the ROE. Um, those 30 days can be extended to 90 days or up until the end of the semester. Now that's not our first choice, but if it does, if we do need that, that's something in our back pocket. Um, our practice is to find a long-term sub, someone with the Pell, with the endorsement to do that, but. Um, on a rare occasion, an emergency occasion, we will fill that with the sub. Uh, 5220 AP2. So just really quick, this is not a policy, it's a procedure. However, it involves board money. And so typically I like this one to be approved by the board. Now the request I have today is to give me some direction that I can operationalize um, by tomorrow, hopefully. If, if the board is ready. If not, I understand and we can wait. <clears throat> but normally, I um, any AP, any exhibit that don't involve board money, um, we, don't, we don't push for first and second reading. It's just the, the, the administration has the, as long as we're not in compliance, as long as we're complying with the policy above. So for example, if we wanted to make a change to uh, 5240, we wouldn't be able to do so. But if we wanted to make a change to 5240 AP1, we can do so as long as we're not violating 5240. So does that make sense? So in this case, I do have 5220 on the agenda. I also have 5220 AP2. So AP2 is not a policy, but it requires that there's board money involved. So I, I, I believe the board should see this. However, I would like, if possible, um, this to be approved, if approved tonight, that I can operationalize and, and adopt some language. Does that make sense? S yes. Uh, so Ray, I have a question. Um, uh, I have a few comments on this that that I'd like to kind of ex kind of do a little bit more of a deep dive on. Should sure. you should we get through the rest of it and then come back to this, or uh, what's your preference? Um, I don't have a preference. The rest. This is this is. The this, star of the show. This, this is the meat? Yes. The rest is non-substantive. Changes? For the most part, yeah. Okay. So if you want me to just quickly do the rest and then come back to this page, I can do that. Maybe we do that just to kind of make sure that everything gets a full reading and then we can come back to this. So in the packet, it's page, I think, 47. So for anyone who needs that reference. Okay. 5, 2, 40. Um, for this one and for um, 5290, <coughs> we're adding language that it already exists um, <coughs> in school code. For some reason, it, it wasn't in District 219's policy, but I think it's good language. Um, one of which is when there is an outside investigation, um, whether DCFS or any other outside agency, uh, and they recommend to us that an employee should be put on some sort of paid leave, we want to well, we do now, but we, we'd like the language to be in there. Um, they'll, they'll be on paid leave pending the outcome, and then um, we'll, have to, we'll have to act accordingly if there's some sort of finding in that outside investigation. And this okay. is um, non-bargainable, so it's outside of um, Correct. the negotiation. Work. Correct. Okay. Yeah, and, and from the union's position, they would like their members to be paid pending the investigation too. It's been our practice. It's, it's, it's not something um, we're looking to change or bargain at all, so. Uh, 5250 
there is a new law that's going to be in effect January 1, I believe, uh, but it's called the Child Extended Bereavement Act. Hopefully we never have to use this, but should you, um, should you need this, you, you can get 12 weeks unpaid leave. And this is coming from state law. Um, I also re-added, um, you'll see in the bottom of page three or four, um, leave to serve as an officer, trustee, or representative specific organization. It is school code language. I'm not sure why it wasn't in there. Uh, we do have a few people exercising this leave, so I just um, wanted to re-add it. One of the things that <clears throat> uh, Andrew and I were trying to do is, is make sure we just do an audit of our policies. For some reason, before my time, there was a, a big deviation from press and so I, I think going back to press might be a better idea so that's just one example where we're going back to press and then lastly of there the COVID uh, paid administration largely we don't need a lot of that language but when applicable we will go back to COVID protocols hopefully never hopefully never correct <laughs> 5290 um, I mentioned this earlier, this is adding uh, the suspension language in, case, well, in the event of an outside investigation. And then it looks like there's a big change, but we just moved one paragraph to the bottom. So just a reformatting, again, going back to press's format. <clears throat> 5330, um, Child Extended Bereavement Act. You're gonna see it twice because one policy applies to uh, certified staff, the other applies to support staff. Um, 615, um, it's just a reformatting, <coughs> essentially all the same language. 630, legal references towards the middle of the page. Mm -hmm. 650, um, kind of a weird one, but it's coming from school code. Uh, we are required to have goals for other school-based activities goals that promote, um, support and promote wellness and healthy eating and all of that. So what does that actually mean? I'm not quite sure, um, but that's something that um, we'll have to look at as a team on whether what are our other school-based activities and how can we promote these types of wellness goals. I think uh, we talked as a day two activity and nutritionists weighing in on what's on the menu after the fact. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. So after the fact, like day two, a nutritionist swing in on our menu choices. Oh, the menu choices. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll have to meet with, um, I mean, school based activities is broad. So I don't know if that's our activities, if that's athletics, if that's, I, I, I read it, my first read example. is. Yeah. yeah. So I, 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 so I have some time until second reading. I'll get a better understanding of what what that actually looks like to operationalize. I think uh, I think Ray's. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I think Ken is referencing to you, Ray, the first bullet point. Schools will uh, support and promote a healthy eating environment for students. And I think one of the things we discussed at the policy committee. Oh, to look at the menu. Right. Is perhaps less policy, more implementation, or more procedural. Um, is you know a nutritionist weighing in on what an actual menu looks like Got for it. our our students? Okay. Six sixty. Um, adding some content, uh, curriculum content, <clears throat> starting in the fall. Um, Fall of 2023, the dangers of fentanyl, plus um, beginning, I think that's fall 2024, actually. Let me make sure. Because the next one is fall 24. Native American history um, in North America are both added to the, to the policy. 760, um, there, is, there is a different residence statute for students with disabilities and so we're just um, adding that to the actually it, it was at the bottom press moved it up um, but it's not new law 770 legal references 
7160. Um, there was some case law around this, um, but, but there is now language where, um, as a result of that case law, that, this, that, that a district cannot prohibit the right of a student to accessorize their student graduation attire. Now, we still maintain the right to um, protect the educational process. We, we have a, a duty to minimize disruptions. And so that's a case-by-case -case analysis, uh, like a lot of student attendance and a lot of student speech is, um, and that's what makes the job very difficult. But um, they do have a right to express themselves at graduation as well. 7190, uh, we kind of have some broad language in there to add to academic dishonesty. Um, you know, this is a, an area that we're, we're still trying to learn and tackle, but AI technology as a result, as it impacts student work. Um, so you'll see it's broad and that there may be an instance where it is authorized, but any unauthorized usage would be grounds for um, discipline. Um, seven to 70, just some verbiage change or terminology change. Seven to 85, non-substantive changes, mostly just that legal reference at the bottom. Seven to 90, um, just changing the requirement for training. Uh, it used to be for licensed school personnel administrators, including paras. Now it includes all district staff. So you're talking about your secretary of staff, your maintenance uh, are required to be trained about the warnings of suicidal behavior. 7345, legal references. And the last one, um, again, this one is reverting back to press language, um, but it was likely reviewed with the uh, closed exemption item where the board can now discuss whether or not someone should be denied from, denied from um, school events or on school property. So just not a big change there, but um, likely reviewed at the same time. So I will bring you guys back to page 47 or 48. 5220 AP2. Um, this is our administrative procedure for substitute teacher rate of pay. Right now, uh, com compared to our, 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 uh, the data that we received, we are on the lower end. So the original proposal was to bring them to from 150 so this is our day-to-day -day subs sub, subs with a sub license <clears throat> bring them to $160 per day from 150 when we looked at the data again while that's competitive with the data we received if you look at just regional data so our neighboring school districts in this area we're still on the lower end so as opposed to the 160 I, I, I would our HR's recommendation is 180 per day, um, and then bringing anyone with the Pell to 220 per day. The bottom of that we think is still competitive, um, but 180 per day we think will increase our sub pool. We need the more subs we can get, the better. Um, and uh, another option would be to um, right now under the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, um, if an employee works 30 hours per week or 120 hours per month, the employer is required to offer insurance. Um, and so right now we would be offering Blue Advantage. Another way to address the sub pool, and, and let me back up, our sub pool, the demographics largely are retired individuals. So they're on Medicare, they likely won't need HMO Blue Advantage. But if we're looking for ways to increase the size of our pool, we could potentially attract younger subs, subs who aren't on Medicare by offering the healthcare. Um, 
So right now, if you hit a certain limit, you, you are offered the health care. You can deny it if you don't want it. Um, but perhaps another way to do that is to offer the Blue Advantage health care. What does that mean? For the board's contribution, it's $7,953, and the employee pays three fifty. dollars So um, right now, again, if you exceed a certain limit, you're asked, do you want Blue Advantage? It'll cost you $350 in annual premium. Um, so the board has a, a few levers to pull here. They can just, you can just focus on the, the rate of pay per day or do a combination of the insurance as well. Um, maybe we'll get some younger, younger subs as well with that or just go with the, the rate of pay. And then um, anyone who hits a certain threshold will be offered the insurance they'll be asked to pay the 350 to cover um, cover their premium and then the board will pay the rest just like any other blue advantage uh, employee in our district so Question just a couple here. options so um, just from a bigger picture standpoint the hiring issues that we have are really systemic and common it's nothing unique about d219 in that regard we don't expect that to significantly change, I would expect. So uh, is it a safe assumption that long term it would be more sustainable to increase this pool and come up with levers to have a, a larger pool to work with? Yeah, if we, so if we could increase our sub pool, that would be great. Um, one other non-financial that we're looking at is um, right now it's um, each there each job has a code in our system there are some positions that don't require a sub There's many that do and then many that are kind of on the fence um, so for example my position i don't request a sub um, my assistant i don't request a sub but there are a bunch of you know, positions, teachers, paras, for the most part, that, that that's an automatic. There's others, though, that I'm not sure we need to fill with subs. So we're kind of taking away our, from our sub pool by filling those positions when potentially they could just, the work for that can just wait. So we're auditing that. So that's one way to not take away from our sub pool. The others would be to try to be more competitive with our region and, and see if we can match the pay that, that's in our area or do one better and, and offer the Blue Advantage single. So my question was on the insurance. You said that once they cross a threshold, we could offer it. What, what exactly do you mean by what? What's the number of days or what's the threshold? Yeah, so it's 30 hours per week. So what that works out to is if you work four days, you hit the limit. On the fifth day, the system blocks it. Now, if we absolutely need it, we'll override it. Um, or it's 120 hours per month. So you're looking at, <clears throat> um, you can't exceed it if we limit you to four days a week on a four week month. But on a five week month where you are a 4.5 week month where you kind of have those two extra days, you could exceed 120. We're seeing more so that um, our subs are hitting that weekly limit and they do want to work the extra day. So again, we we try to stay below it but there are times when we just need the subs um now if we um offer the insurance there may be incentive for some to just i'm going to work as much as i can i'll maintain the subs so how or maintain the insurance so how do we operationalize this you can do it on a look back period so what we would do is we take last year's data you've reached the limit you are eligible for insurance this year then the next school year, we'll do another look back period. You did not work, um, so we're going to take your insurance off. But if you meet it again in the following year, you'll get insurance again. So it's kind of a delayed cycle, but it's really the only way to operationalize um, for the sub pool. We expect the, uh, the long-term subs versus the day-to-day -to, -day to hit that threshold mainly. Say that again? So is this long-term subs? No, this is our day-to-day -day subs. So what, what do the numbers look like now in terms of that would be at that four day? 
what numbers are you referring to? The day-to-day -day subs. So you're saying at four days, basically, we would be offering it, right? So what would be the, um, the impact based off the data we have now? The cost of insurance? Yes. Oh, okay. So if we looked at last year's data, um, give me one second. Yeah, last year's data is what I was trying to say. Sorry. So if we looked at last year, we we only had we had I don't know if only is the right word, but we had eight nineteen subs that would be eligible for insurance. So if we did nineteen times um, the full premium of Blue Advantage single, you're looking at one hundred and fifty thousand and nine hundred twenty four dollars, roughly. Now, that's assuming each and every one of those wants insurance. What's hard is many of those individuals are retirees and are going to decline insurance. So I don't, I can't tell you for certain what the actual what the actual is. is. Now, if this does work and we attract a younger crowd, you can see that number probably go up, right? But with our existing subs, we we have reason to believe many are just going to say, I, changing it is a hassle. I don't. I'd rather just stay on the Medicare. So that's where I, I don't know if I answered your question, but it's kind of a we don't it's an unknown there. Okay, I got it. Um, yeah, go ahead. It's going to continue on the on the insurance. So most people I know, once you agree that you want insurance, you kind of want it for the entire year. So how how do we collect those premiums during the summer if those subs are not working and such? I mean, do so, they pay in advance or? So you we want, the way we would operationalize it. To be quite honest, to operationalize is going to be hard. Yeah which is why we thought of maybe the board can just cover it because it might be cheaper in paying the 350 than to put in the labor by HR to operationalize. Now, if you do the look back period, we would have to have the employee to agree to either an upfront payment or some sort of divided by agreement because as a sub, I could work max in August, take a break in September, max in October, and it's hard to predict how much of the premium I can take out per paycheck versus an employee that's full-time, you just divide it by the paychecks and you, you can expect. Um, so we would operational, if, if the board paid for it, it, there's nothing to operationalize. You get insurance, you can opt out or not. If the board doesn't pay for it, they'd still get insurance, they can opt out, but we would have to figure out a system of Either you have an option to just pay it up front, um, make equal installments of, I don't know, four or five or six, I don't know, whatever they're comfortable with and get to that agreement and we'll just deduct it. I'm just speaking for myself. So I, I'm very comfortable with having us possibly at the first read change the hourly rate, but I think we need to work out a little bit more of the logistics in terms of the insurance before I'm comfortable having that on the first read moving on to the second. Just quick question. So we, it, so the subs that are working right now that are averaging about four, you know, 30 hours a week, is the, are they covering like teacher illnesses, IEP meetings? So if we did raise the rate, we would have potentially a bigger pool, right, of subs. So then wouldn't it, wouldn't <coughs> they, then we may not, have as many subs that would that's end other, up working yeah. the four So days. that's the other thing. If, if in fact it does work and we raise our pool, unless our absences go even further, really it could reach a point where many, I, I, I can't say for certain, but it, there's a potential where there's not enough assignments to then pick up the insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no guarantee that it'll pick up. Um, but we do know that there are IMRF limitations and we don't recommend crossing that threshold. I think it's 599 hours because then the board have to pay for the pension program. So we do limit them there. Um, but the limit doesn't call the, with that limit in, in place. And I, I should have brought the number <clears throat> that doesn't allow a sub to work every single day at our district. So strategically we want to be able to cover not just the first day of school, but you know, in April and, and, and March. And so there are subs that um, take our guidance and we say, hey, these are some slower months. 
go do your doctor's appointments then go do your travel then here's where we need you um and they they listen to that some plan in advance they know the limits i'm going to work these days take a vacation off and they kind of spread it out but to answer your question if it increases the number of subs we have and assuming the n number of assignments stay flat there is a potential that some of them won't even reach the limit um but that's assuming the number of subs goes up by i i don't know the number the quick math in my head yeah but that is a possibility um, so one of the key um elements of the aca was that it, insurance had to be affordable and if i remember correctly they've changed the percentage um a few times but very small by a small amount and generally it's been um when i was researching it for our you know as a benefit manager we could only charge like nine percent or less of the employee's um salary like annual salary so there are restrictions on how much you could charge for the insurance it has to be affordable that's the key element of that whole thing so blue advantage is our is our most affordable one uh 350 a year i think will it should we'll, fall yeah, yeah it'll it'll f yeah be fine <laughs> number what so i so i like joe support the amendment uh for the um the one to ten day taught sub license to the 180. um i i wonder if we will monitor that and if there is a call for insurance we can come back and revisit that conversation um, I, I think that we, we have to increase our sub pool and um, basic economic supply and demand, right? Supply, if the demand is high, I, we're just, we have to be able to compete. And yep. right now we are not, we, we have, we're getting great subs. We are getting wonderful people. I wonder if by increasing it, we can get more people. And it also, you know, gives back to some of the subs who have really stuck with stuck with us through through um, you know some lean years. So I'm I completely support the amendment to the 180. I think offering this structure uh, for the regular substitute um, absolutely makes sense in my mind. Um, for procedural purposes, Ray, do you need us to pull this out? to be able to vote on it tonight or because it doesn't technically need a vote are we just looking for like some fun thumbs up here yeah We're just fun tonight. fun thumbs would be great yeah. okay um so for this if i understand correctly i'm reading this this the change to be one sub license would be 180 per day mm -hmm. and then one pell license or the the pell to be 220 per day mm -hmm. with no change to insurance i and and uh, just to be clear, I didn't bring the insurance idea to the policy committee. It was just something we worked on as we were just brainstorming. Um, and mm -hmm. just we thought maybe that's a way to increase our sub. So um, I think what we'd like for that to happen, um, perhaps, Ray, is that we would like to check back in and, you know, maybe in the spring and see if there has been a significant increase, kind of what it hopefully there has been what the ramifications are are people asking for insurance are they hitting that insurance like is that what's holding people back from signing up into our sub pool and then we can address it at that point and I, I think um, it also might be advantageous to look at some peer districts that have a larger sub pool uh, and what that demographic breakdown is mm. are we seeing more younger subs that are wanting uh, those benefits so at least we can kind of maybe I know we, we don't know what will happen right but we can at least try to forecast what might happen and make an informed decision number know it since this is the first reading and I don't want to give you extra work but I kind of do want to give you extra work <laughs> um, situation came up where in a in a in a committee of the board uh, unfortunately there was a risk that the board meeting would not take place because we didn't have a physical quorum of the two board members that were on the team 
and the conversation came up as a possibility that maybe in our our, our policy we could make the board president uh, a de facto third member on every committee or their designee so that we could continue having these meetings by having two board members present if one is sick or out because uh, I hate you know we only meet in subcommittees once a month or once a quarter and if we can't get a quorum it would be nice if we have advance notice to potentially have that second board member be assigned or or you yourself so I don't know where that would be in policy I haven't looked I apologize yeah it's in 2150 um, and I can bring that for first reading in uh, January Okay, thank you. It would be the designee. <laughs> <laughs> I've got more than enough meetings, my friend. <laughs> I mean, right. as you know, okay. policy committee is the best committee. So, I mean. All right, so just want to make sure. I will bring uh, 2150, that's the board committee policy, to first reading in January. The entire packet will come to second reading in January, and then um, starting tomorrow, I will operationalize 5228P2 by raising the sub rate to 180 per day and the PAL rate of 220 per day. Correct. Fun thumbs. Great. Thank you guys so much. The so that subs means will appreciate in 45 it. minutes, it will be ready. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is that that's as quick he as works pretty yeah, fast. Yeah. <laughs> they we have a sub appreciation breakfast tomorrow, so this is the best news I can give them tomorrow. Right. So yeah. 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 <laughs> We're here to help. <laughs> there, there's a virtual background of claps going on. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I have for you guys. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, right. Thank you. I don't believe we have any new business. Um, so with great anticipation, hey, the superintendent's report is what we're waiting on, right? <sighs> Member Wood. <laughs> I know. Um, I would love to hear an update about the website. You will get an update about the website. I love it. Let's do it. Um, but first, because I promised Brett Bildstein, and so next month I'll update on three West students or four West students, but I promised I'd share this update because a, a few really incredible achievements at North that he asked me to highlight specifically to the board. Um, seniors, Eva, Eva Shaver and Kelly Wen both qualified for the state and girls swimming and diving. Um, they both shattered the two longest standing North records as well. Ava leads as the six dive and 11 dive record holder and Kelly finishes with the fastest 100 yard breaststroke time in North's history. Ooh. Yes. Junior Evan Parker finished 14th overall at the Boys State Cross Country Meet, earning him all state honors. What's interesting though is he set a personal record time of uh, 14.38.9, which was 35 seconds faster than his previous personal best in the state meet. He, he entered the state finals as the 74th fastest time from the 3A sectionals and ended up getting 14th place. So really coming through in the right moment. And then our um, conference champion and number six ranked state soccer team, um, Coach Philip Sejovic received sectional coach of the year as voted by the Coaches Association. Senior Trey Zakari was honored on the state sectional team. And finally, in a name that will sound familiar based on previous presenters tonight, what a year for senior Quinn Graham. Um, Quinn made the All-State team, was even one of three Illinois players to make the All-Midwest team. First time in school history this player has made the All-Midwest team. It should also be noted that Quinn broke the single season goal mark last year when he had 32 goals. He rebroke it this year with 42 goals. An unbelievable season and a career for Quinn. Um, update on the migration. It's going to take a little bit longer. Um, I, 
I am promised that during the February board meeting, we will demonstrate with the board and it will be unveiled here in February um, at the latest March. But I, I said February, I can say. And I've been assured February is when we can and then unroll, unveil it to parents afterwards. So not too much time. And, um, you know, we are halfway through the year. We do have um, mid-year capstone events coming up. We have um, a vacation time. I have to say that um, I do think this is one of those things coming here was different. I do think I'm a big believer now in that mid-year break that students get and closing off a semester and really having that um, mental health time. So um, I just want to wish all of our students good luck as they go into this time period, finish strong over these next two and a half weeks. I'll be sending out messages both to staff and to students about course selection. I think it's the most important time of the year in terms of not just equity in our classrooms, but also letting kids know that we believe in them and what they can do. And um, some of those numbers that we talked about at our last meeting. So um, really, I just hope that everybody, as we enter what is a holiday season for many, but no matter what, hopefully some family time for people. Um, at the mid-year break, I want to thank my team, many of whom presented tonight, and um, but really all of our staff members and all you board members, I just wish everybody some um, a time of good peace and spending time with loved ones at the end of this month. So. Amen. Clear paths, bright futures, and no limits. <laughs> and we're seeing no limits in some of those performances there. We'd like to see some limits on the time of these meetings. <laughs> yes, well, that's the stretch goal for 2024 to uh, get out, get out before midnight. <laughs> Everybody's like, we're going to get out so early today. I'm like, yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, next we have board committee reports, if there are any. I don't believe there are any. because Policy committee presented. just read out first reading. Yes. Awesome. Informational items. Uh, the information for FOIA, monthly finance reports, and CFC IGA have been provided. Um. We do not need to go back into closed session. Therefore, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All right, can I roll call, please? Member Nowak? Yes. Member Wood? Yes. Member Dr. Coe? Member Jacobs? Yes. Member Abraham? Yes. Member Stennett? Yes. Member Durr? Oh, yes. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Eleven twenty-two. Everybody sure they don't want to close session? Just for kids. We feel. We feel.